I want to start off this show by wishing everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. It wasn't until I started editing this show that I realized this would be the last one of 2019. Crazy how time flies. When we started this little experiment a few years back, I felt confident that we'd end up with a large audience, some good numbers of people listening, which we have. We have north of 6,000 downloads every episode. What really surprised me, though, and has become my personal favorite part of the Hammer Factor is the level of engagement we've received. Weekend warriors, top pros, manufacturers, retailers, event organizers, you name it. It's amazing the far-reaching and diverse audience that shares this passion for the river. On behalf of everyone at the Hammer Factor, thank you for listening, and may 2020 see you paddling more and better than ever before. Okay, let's get to it. Welcome to episode number special episode number 69 here on the Hammer Factor. I mean, come on. <laughs> you can't not chuckle about that. Lucky 69. Oh, man. My name is John Grace, host of this, uh, producer here at the show. I'd like to introduce my co host, um, Whitewater legend and owner of Immersion Research, uh, John Weld, and policy director and North Fork champion, Lewis Geltman. Fellas, it's been a while. Whew. But we're, we're really nailing it on the first of the month <laughs> resolution, huh? <laughs> yeah. We had at least a dozen emails. I didn't forward those along. One guy was like, hey, my mom told me to send you guys an email when you were going to release another episode. <laughs> <laughs> was that one directed to the ABRG? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but we have got an action-packed show for you. We do have the ABRG coming on to explain some of the inner workings of the paddle sports industry and some recent news that's came along. This has pretty much blown us up, come across our desk at several points. We have Evie Lamberth on the show, um, 15-year-old slalom. Lieb Farth. Lieb Farth on the show. Thank you, Lewis. Evie Lieb Farth on the show. Uh, 15-year-old phenom from Bryson City here in North Carolina, and uh, she is going to go into some of the details about her slalom career. What's next? I'm super excited about that. I am too. Way to get her on, man. That's sweet. Um, And as well, we have a sponsor, top of the show sponsor for this show. I'd like to thank Extreme Sport Veco, who is hosting the 2020 Extreme Kayaking World Championships, June 21st and June 28th in Norway. This is the uh, AWP World Championships that just happened out at the North Fork um, this past June. Has now moved to uh, extreme, the uh, Extreme Sport Veco, June 21st through June 28th. Um, pretty cool. Had an interesting conversation with the guys there at Extreme Sport Veco. If you want to check out everything you need to find out about the event and about kayaking in Norway, go to extremesportveco.com forward slash hammer factor. Um, that URL is where you need to go to check out everything that you need to know about travel, where to stay, how you can camp anywhere, some of the rivers around Voss. And uh, I'm going to put a video up there from the Lower Rama. You guys have never been kayaking in Norway, have you? I haven't. Oh, man. Everything, mm-hmm. Every time I think of Norway, I just think of the Lower Rama. Have you ever seen that river, or does it ring a bell? Mm-hmm. It does ring a bell. Oh, I feel man. like when I think about kayaking in Norway, I think about probably the fir- my first exposure to that as a thing was the LVM, I'm sure. And I just mm-hmm. like remember seeing you, Grace, running like – 
money drop, which at the time seemed like pretty extreme, you know, and just being like, damn, like these guys are killing it. This is sick. Dude, that's just one of the many sick roadside drops. Literally, that drop is right next to the road. It's insane. Anyway, go to extremesport.gov forward slash hammer factor. Big thanks to those guys for coming on and sponsoring the show. Um, man, we got a big show lined up. Big show. Big show. God, what a what how, so much has happened. So much has happened. So much. Dude, can I tell you guys about my morning? Yeah, let's hear it. So it's just been like waiting for this. I mean, this has been like the worst two years of kayaking in the gorge that I can remember. And like the magic words for the rain forecast out here are atmospheric river, like which is this phenomenon where sort of some tropical moisture from around Hawaii gets like directed at the Pacific Northwest. And they've been forecasting this atmospheric river for like a week now. And I'm like, come on, atmospheric river, atmospheric river, atmospheric river, just like, like clicking between like Wonderground, Cliff Mass Weather Blog, Northwest, we- uh, the National Weather Service forecaster discussion, just like, like, come on, where's the rain? Where's the rain? Where's the rain? And like they keep like downgrading the precip totals. And I like went to bed last night and it didn't rain at all. And I was just like, like, this is a jet, man. We're just there's pulling the rug out from under us. And I like I got up this morning at like six and it's dark out. And I like check water levels and like the white salmon is barely budged. But the wind is like, you know, like eight and a half feet. And so I like I text, which is high. And I so I text Andrew McEwen, my brother in law, and I'm like, dude, can you get him paddle? And he's like, no, I'm watching the kids. And I'm like, all right, whatever. So like, I'm like, okay, like, I'm not just going to like sit here and drink coffee in the dark and like pout. I'm going to just like, I'm going to drive over the little way and just, just, just see, you know, like, and I like, I'm like, should I even put a boat in the truck? Like, it's stupid. There's no way it's going to be in. And I like, I drive over there and I like, like, there's no water on the side of the road. Like, it's just like nothing. I'm just like, this is stupid. I don't know why I'm even doing this. This is just like desperate times. And I get there and the water is brown and like the water is on. And I'm like under the bridge by myself. It's like, you know, the sun's barely up and I'm just like yelling. You know? I'm just like, yes. <laughs> So I, so I like I text, I call Andrew, and I'm like, dude, water's on. Like, like, can you and, and Pip like come pick me up at the takeout? <laughs> he's like, I don't know. Like, he's like, oh, my sister's out. Like, my sister, his wife is out. Like, with my niece. Like, she's like, they'll be back in a little bit. Maybe I can come paddling. And I'm like, all right, dude, I'm just gonna put on. So I got L Dub season opener this morning, solo, dawn patrol. Yeah. Just like, just like so happy like it was just finally like christmas miracle man andrew met me at the takeout got another lap like and it's low it's only like two nine but it was still just like ah i'm like so much more chipper now it's like the world has regained its color (laughs) dude i can see it in your face (laughs) well you're Uh, still a little pasty Oh, uh, that's rad, dude. So it's almost three feet coming up. I don't know. We'll see if it comes up. It's like there's more rain in the forecast. It's just like not raining in White Salmon. Like there was like a tenth of an inch of rain in the rain gauge in my house this morning. But I think it's because all the precip's coming in like south to north. So it's not like making it over the cascade and kind of like penetrating east at all. So like, I don't know, the wind's coming up, like everything kind of like north of Portland's coming up. I hope it's still raining in the headwaters a little way. Like there's like another day of rain in the forecast and then like everything else. I mean, like if you're up around Seattle, everything's Richter right now, but we're kind of the last ones to get the water in the gorge typically. So I don't know. I'm stoked, man. Finally. How many days did you get on the water last year, Lewis? Don't know. What do you, it seems like not as many as usual. I don't know. 150. God, dude. see, that's like- so badass, dude. I mean, I feel like usually in a good water year, it's like well over 200. I mean, I probably, yeah. I mean, like when the little white's in, I'll go every day. Man, I set a goal for 100 days this year, and I got, actually, I got 53, but if you count the 10 days I just got on the Grand Canyon, I got 63. So, but, God, dude, I got to get 100. I got to get back to 100. How many you got, Weld? It's been my worst paddling year of my life. That's There's just been no water here. And yeah. people are like, we're going to go the little or the white salmon. And I'm like, 
I can't Dude, do it. You got to come out and get on the longboat program. Like, I just with... can't do it. It's so boring. It's I, like I'm sorry. I, I know you're like out for this. It's so boring, right? I just can't I mean, do it. I, there's so many other things I'd rather do besides the... not. I just like... rather because at least I burn a calorie, you know. <laughs> But at least this way, you like when the little white comes in, it's like you feel good and it's like you're ready. You know, that's it's the pro- like, right. That's the problem. That's the problem because I paddle literally three days in a year, and then people are like, "Let's go in the little white." I'm like, "I haven't paddled in six months." Last time I paddled was in the upper yacht. Dude, come on with you? me and Andrew, man. We're, we've been like smashing the long bit laps. It's like, I mean, it's not that fun, that's, but it's that just would be. I just, not. I just, I don't have it in me. I really don't. Dude, as soon as it's you get problem. the ball rolling, you'll be back though. I go, I go back at, go back out east, and like I went in the summer, we had water there. I paddled every day. I was back home every single day because we had a ton of water, and there was interesting stuff to paddle. Do you want to get, you want to get wave hoppers? No, no. Did <laughs> wave hopping? I left that <laughs> long behind. I don't want a piece of that. You no, know? God, it's a problem, man. I don't know. I gotta should deal we, with it. Should we tell Grace about our our nester regime we've been on? This is like, I feel like draws like a. This is a telling detail that Weld and I. Come on, I, now you gotta. I gotta hear this. <laughs> so, so Nestor Peak is uh, it's up behind the takeout for the lower white salmon, or the yeah, you know, takeout for the lower white salmon, the put in for the bottom, and it's like I don't know, it's like three thousand foot peak with a really good single track mountain bike descent on it, and a long fire road climb up. And what Weld and I have been doing is Weld will park at the bottom leave his truck there and ride his cross bike to the top. I'll show up, pick up his truck, drive it to the top, and then ride my mountain bike down the single track. It's like, <laughs> well, well climbs and doesn't want to descend the fire road on his cross bike. And I don't, I want, to burn, I don't want to burn my brakes up. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like we don't even see each other. Like, that, like, like, <laughs> like my mom was in town and she's like, she's like, yeah, did you have a nice ride with John? I'm like, I actually didn't see John. I just drove his truck to the top of the road. <laughs> <laughs> that makes zero sense. That That's makes... like the most social thing I've done in like all year, also, <laughs> by the way. Jesus, <laughs> I'm almost depressed from hearing that. Oh, man. I was depressed when I was looking at my journal because I was, I just can't believe I, 53 days. I, I don't think I've had a day in the past, or a year in the past 20 years, less than 100 days. 63. I got to say 63 because I did have the 10 days in the Grand Canyon, but I'm going to do better this year. How was Grant? Oh, it was so rad. We had two days of rain, but it was crazy. It was humid. We had no like chap lips or any of that stuff going on. It was never cold. We never had any frozen gear. We had highs of 60, lows of 40. Um, killer group, you know, the way we do it is, you know, we paddled the 225 miles or whatever in 10 days, but I mean, we've got a packed itinerary. We hiked I don't know, I think 16,000 feet of vertical. So we had several Damn. hikes where we got way out of the canyon and did a bunch of like out and arounds and explored a bunch of stuff, saw a bunch of, I mean, we have a, we have a full hit list. Literally, I have my uh, action ticker GPS device watch and I would turn it on when we'd gear up and push off in the morning and no matter what we were doing, hiking, paddling, done. And I'd turn it off when we got back to camp when we were kind of done doing our stuff. And it was like, basically eight or nine hours of exercise every day so i don't know just good simple clean living you know one thing i did see a group of pack rafters out there and uh hammer factor uh listener and writer in dan thurber you guys remember the email from dan thurber and uh anyway i saw him out there with a group of pack rafters and really checked out their pack drafts and Talk to him. Why for would a you pack while. raft the Grand Canyon? Now that is a very good question. That makes no sense. And Let's I bring th- a raft raft. And, and I think that Dan recognized that it made no sense. But he had some dudes who wanted to do it, and they weren't really kayakers, and they were swimming at all the big rapids. But I bet I bet hermit in a pack raft would be a really good time. Yeah, dude, they were having a blast. <laughs> I mean, they were smiling ear to ear. Um, interesting when those dudes swim, they just jump back in their pack raft it's not like you have to like go empty your stuff out or whatever it doesn't even really slow them down they just like jump out and jump back in it and keep paddling some interesting stuff about those things i didn't know this they have like a dry suit zipper and you unzip them and they so they put all their dry bags and all their gear inside the actual inflatable part 
Mm. So it's insane. That's a idea. It's insane how much stuff you can put inside them. Um, but no, I had a super interesting conversation with Dan. We'll have to have him come on. He wants to come on and talk about some hammer, some uh, pack rafting trips, and he's done some cool ones. He, I don't know if you've seen any of his videos. He's out there like doing Velocito and a bunch of other stuff. Um, he's a class five kayaker, but it was cool. Sick trip, sick trip. Um, where, where, how was South America? Oh, it was nice, man. Um, were you on a kayaking trip? I did, or I was. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's been pretty grim times down here. And, uh, my buddy Nate's was just like, I don't know twisted my arm pretty hard to go down there so i we did a quick little chile trip uh flew into tamuco paddled a few days around pucon went to the fui and did a little tour down to the south hung out at the fuda for like a week or so and cruised back up so like quick a little less than three weeks but it was nice man the fuda is like my happy place the river is so gloriously fun just really nice so yeah it was good three weeks nothing huh? nothing exciting to report but yeah it's fun well i don't know i gotta get more than a hundred days of paddling this year <clears throat> we have new 2020 whitewater journals that are on the page that recently came in so those are cool we have about 36 of those left 38 of those left and uh how about the creature craft shirts we have some creature craft shirts they're just about sold out though <laughs> <laughs> I sent you guys both one, so you're in there, so you're good. But <laughs> the Creature Craft shirts, did we? if you want a Creature Craft shirt, there are a few left. I don't know how many are left. <laughs> and even if you don't want a Creature Craft shirt, you got to get look at this Yeah, it's design. a great shirt. It is, it is really, <laughs> really funny. I'm sending you guys both. both I got mine. So. Oh, you already got yours? Okay. Yeah, thank huh, you. I don't know where mine is. Thanks, dude. <clears throat> yeah. But no, that's <laughs> we've got all kinds of comments. We had a... Who's, who's who's art is that again? Beth Millions. Beth Millions. That was awesome. Thank you, Beth. <laughs> yeah, it was super cool. Um, yeah, gotta 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 mention that there are a few of those t-shirts left. Um, what else is on my to-do list to talk about here before we move down the line? Man, we got a lot to talk about. Woo! Dude, I'm so excited Jesus. to talk about the, the <laughs> confluence stuff with you guys. Oh, I, like, we, we have not had any pre-conversation about this at all, and I'm dying to get into this. Before we, before we do that, can, should we talk about, about Pat Keller? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> What's there to talk about? What, what, what'd you, how would you introduce this, this part of the show? Well, Pat Keller... Uh, you know, was on Insta on Instagram and posted some, I mean, by everybody's account, pretty controversial stuff, right? And why it matters is because he's Pat Keller and he's an IR athlete as well as Liquid Logic athlete and Astral athlete. And uh, as a result of his postings, you know, we all all three of us, were, you know, we, we all three of those manufacturers, we all know each other pretty well. Um, we, you know, we received some blowback from customers saying, what are you guys going to do about this? Right. And so what do we do about this? Can we talk, I mean, <laughs> what, we just, I mean, does the whole pallet world know what this is about or should we, is this worth getting into? I don't know. If this well, we've is, gotten this into it now. <laughs> I don't know if this is worth getting into or not. I mean, different strokes well, for different folks. I mean, there's a fringe political group called QAnon, right? If you guys don't know who QAnon is, you can look it up. I, I, I'm not going to offend Pat by saying this is a fringe group, right? This is not <laughs> this is not what you'd call mainstream politics by any means. Uh, it's it's out there, man. Uh, God, I mean, head. the bigger question is, 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 you know, is what is a as an when does an athlete? I mean, what what is what's the role of an athlete in this regard? Right, we expect him to be a good boater and a good ambassador for the sport, and, uh, you know. And if you read Pat's stuff, there's nothing hateful on there. He's not like making racist or, you know, threats or anything like that. But he's just deep in the web. I don't know. I don't have a lot to say about it. You know, I've known Pat for a long time. He's my buddy, but right. I mean, he's we're all <laughs> sitting here looking at each other about this because the truth <laughs> is, we all know Pat. Pat's a friend of ours. We know where his heart's at, right? We know he's a good guy. I mean, we can't, right? 
I don't think that, I don't I, I, I mean think, I I think the greater question of it all is do politics and brand sponsorship mix you know if you take that also of the they do now we talked about this a year or two ago we talked about how like every brand now is is being held to a, a, you know like there's a litmus test for these brands right like where you stand politically but there's also I mean I think the thing is that it's like this is not we're not in normal times politically right it's like being you know being a Republican or being a Democrat 15 years ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago you know right now what's going on in this country is like it's not it's like at some point at what point does politics cross the line from like you and I disagree about how we pursue our mutual values to something much more grave and sinister than that and you know I'm not trying to be like conspiracy theory about this but like I don't think that that drawing a different standard for things like QAnon or you know being some uh, you know, full throated Trump supporter, like that stuff is, it's it's it is different than you know having voted for George Bush or something. Like it just is, and like so, I, I I don't know how you draw that line, and like I know that there, I can hear the people pecking away at the hate mail right now, and I want to be clear that I'm speaking on my own account here, not on the account of the organization I work for or anything along those lines. It's just me, but. It is different. Like, it is different. And so it's what fun to joke about. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I mean I'm i not saying that... I mean, I'm not going to, like, boycott some brand because they sponsor an athlete who likes Donald Trump. Like, that's just taking it a bridge too far for me. But, you know, like, I think things like... Like, these, like, conspiracy theories and stuff, it's like, you know, if I had somebody who is a you know, real close friend of mine or family member who like bought into this stuff, I'd be like, you need to see a psychiatrist, man. Like this stuff's not real. And it's like, I don't know. I mean, like I, I, it's fun or it's more fun for us just to like laugh about it. But like, it's also like, it's, it's kind of fucked up, man. Like it's bad. It's yeah. A I mean, we're, as a manufacturer, you know, you get these emails and, and you can tell someone just got, they weren't getting anywhere in a, in a screaming match on social media with Pat and they decided they're going to take it. They're going to try and escalate it, you know, take it to the, to the manager, so to speak. And so they're writing the sponsors to see if we, we're not going to step in and make the point for them, which we're not clearly not going to do. Right. Yeah. Just, and I that, think that's, no that's appropriate. That. I'm not, I'm not suggesting you should or anybody else should. I'm just, you know, but like, I don't know. That's, that's where my head's at about it. I don't really know where to go with it. I don't think that brands need to... It's not a brand's responsibility to police the views of their athletes and personnel, you know, so certainly on board with that, but... Dude, this whole... How about, like, call it... How about, how, all right, how about a more mainstream example like uh, Kaepernick, right? I mean, does the NFL have the right to be like, no, we're not, we're not a political organization. You need to... Is there any parallels to be drawn here? I think there are some parallels, and I think it's muddy water. You know, I think, you know, but I it's think... not. I mean, it's not when, when, I mean, there's a difference between standing up for civil rights and standing up for some like crackpot thing you watched on YouTube. Like, it's just not the same. Like, you can't like both sides of that. You know? No, you got a good point. Dude, I don't even know, man. I can't. It's 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 so far out of the scope of what I can't even like start the conversation because I don't know how to like dent that bubble. Do you know what I'm saying? When yeah, when when when, when you're when, talking about discussing this with Pat. Yeah, you know? like we're just you know Pat or anyone well, I, else who's, who's I mean one of the frustrating one of the frustrating things you know? that, one of the frustrating things about any dialogue like this is the is the understanding that this person thinks you're too dumb or too clueless to understand the real the reality, which is frustrating. It's frustrating for anybody to listen to that, right? Um, and, you know, I have no interest in engaging in that kind of a conversation. No. I don't either. Let's move on from this, and let's get into some real news. <laughs> All Thanks right. for bringing that up, Well, yeah. <laughs> Well, I know we got a lot of emails about it, and it was an interesting subject for us. We, You know, I mean, I think all the three companies that I mentioned, we all decided, you know, I think kind of what we discussed here. It was it's an interesting situation, but not one that we're going to weigh in on by letting Pat go or anything like that. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. 
Hey, Pat would save your life on the river as quick as anybody. So. That's right. I mean, that's that's the tr- that's the tough thing about it because if you know Pat, you know he's not a bad guy, right? He's not out to hurt anybody, right? Anyway, <laughs> anyway, he's just a concerned citizen. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, moving on, uh, moving on, moving on. I believe since the last time we have spoke, <laughs> there have been dramatic <laughs> changes at Liquid Logic. There have been extremely dramatic changes at Confluence Water Sports, and there have been some pretty dramatic changes at Jackson Kayak. Um, who wants to fill us in on this? Give us the basic rundown. Lewis, or uh, well, you're more your industry guy lay it on us all right i mean there's what we know and then there's what you know, then there's some rumors and then there's some really well-founded rumors you know we've been on this we've been breaking this story the hammer factor over the past couple episodes uh talking about a growing sense of alarm in the industry um and we made some ins- uh, uh, suggestions that conflicts is in deep trouble a couple episodes ago and took a world of grief for that May, may I say? <laughs> we did. Uh, and then last episode, we were talking about a real crisis in pricing and the health industry. Well, lo and behold, so in the, since we were last here, uh, Confluence has sold to um, Pelican uh, International. When I mean sold, I don't know what the money was involved. I, I We can assume that Confluence was in a pretty, you know, some kind of financial distress and Pelican came in and took over. Now, this is Pelican International, which is not the same thing as Pelican Products. Pelican Products is the peeps that make the, you know, the boxes, the Waterford boxes, whatnot. Not, they're, in Cal- they're in California. Different companies. Not the same. Not the same. Pel- Pelican International is in Quebec. I'll have to say, I'm not a trademark attorney, but if you look at the logos and the name and the type, the font they use, I mean, it sure seems like it is a, some kind of trademark issues here, but... Both these companies have been around for decades, so I don't know how you resolve that kind of thing. Anyway, not the same company. This is Pelican International in Quebec that that took over Confluence. If you know Pelican, they make some fishing kayaks. They make a lot of wreck boats. They make sort of these weird pedal boats you see out in lakes and stuff like that. Um, not what you'd consider to be, you know, performance whitewater or performance kayaks or, you know, expensive kayaks by any means. What they intend to do with Confluence and their host of brands is anybody's guess. How Dagger fits into that, which is where, what we're interested in, who knows? I who mean, knows? I guess my reaction when I heard that was like, it seemed like best case scenario in a way. I mean, the fact that they got acquired before Dagger got shuttered or God knows what happened or before they're just selling off a warehouse and equipment. I mean, it seems like, I guess I heard that and I was like, this seems like good news. I don't. I mean, I, I guess know. We just don't know. But it's my understanding Pelican's been looking at this at Confluence for a while for this kind of a of a of a purchase. But um, I'm going to assume that that uh, you know Pelican took them out of financial distress, right? And I who knows what they what they're going to do with this, right? I don't know. I. But there's more. There's more to the story, which would would help put Dagger's fate in a better context. Uh, Jackson Kayaks is now Jackson Adventure. Their name's changed. Um, EJ, uh, depending on how you want to phrase it, is no longer with the company, right? He's retired. Is that the word he used? Um, Not retired, but uh, resigned. Resigned. Resigned, right. So, to be fair, we should have EJ or come on to discuss exactly what happened but you can fill in the blanks right i think jackson's moving a different direction than whitewater um i I, ej several years ago on on facebook or in boater talk actually uh you know had mentioned that that they'd been losing money for a long time i'm assuming that can you know paddle sports being what it is nowadays that probably continued so i'm sure money was an issue no question about it um now that they're Jackson Adventure, they're really. It seems like they're focusing on a much broader spectrum of products, like fishing kayaks and coolers and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know how their direct sales program is going. I, I'd like to get more information. That we talked about that last time. It's probably a little too early to see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, furthermore, um, our <clears throat> friends at Liquid Logic and Big Adventure um, merged with uh, Bonafide. And Bonafide, if I'm not mistaken, is the guy who started Yak Attack. They make a fishing kayak. 
Um, Luther once again, this Cyprus. kind of a roll up. Yeah, right. Once again, this kind of roll up is usually linked to some kind of money problem. You know, um, they're trying to join forces to to make it work financially. I'm not, you know, I, that's usually why these things happen. Um, so you have the three biggest uh, paddle sports brands in the country making moves, which all suggest financial stress of some sort, right? Yeah, I don't think there's any way to argue that. Yeah. Um, additionally, the Paddle Sports Retailer Show, which I have railed <laughs> against <laughs> the very second they announced this about four years ago. And I will remind people that you can go back to the transcripts, and I called it three years this show would last. That's what it is. The Paddle Sports Retailer <laughs> Show is no more. Who called it first, me or you? I don't know. I Yeah, I guess that was my first reaction when I saw that the the big gear show is that what they're calling it in salt lake and it's the same guys i was like is, are they folding the paddle sports into this or and now are they trying to drag you guys back to salt lake along with this this big gear show that's exactly what's happening yes yeah, so are you going I, back I, to here, salt lake? here's the crazy here's the crazy thing right it's we've been ir has been in the in the business for 25 years right i consider us an industry veteran and and, and many other people in the industry were heard about the same, the same way it was through the someone sent me an email right that that darren and darren uh bush and and sutton bacon the, the two guys that organized the paddle sport show uh they had announced there is a new show the the big the big gear show it had new dates and a new location and the paddle sport show was just going to be there that's how we heard about it and it was just a very matter of fact like that and also point out the show moved to salt lake city uh in july about three weeks after that to a retailer show um, <laughs> and it was going to include biking gear, right? Uh, I, I'm going to uh, presumably because they weren't. It's they were, the the paddle sports show was not financial tenable, financially tenable, which was one of my core problems with the whitewater show to begin with was how to make this kind of a show. It's just financially trade shows are difficult to run and expensive and require a lot of effort. It's very hard for a splinter group to run a trade show like like they suggested. But what do I know? Uh, the the common the word on the street from the from the literally every paddle sports brand and uh, retailer that I've talked to suggests that they have no interest in attending the big gear show. Uh, the opinions that I've people I've talked with ranged from, you know, generally not interested to downright anger. I'll point out that many manufacturers were promised that the PSR, the Palace Sports Show, was going to be in Oklahoma City for years to come. We have booths stored out there in crates in Oklahoma, which we have to go. <laughs> By the way, I'd love to have our booth delivered to Sutton's driveway and parked there with an invoice on it. <laughs> but uh, that's another issue. Um, and additionally, this trade show. So not only they, they're going to have a hard time rallying support, despite their their press release, was, which suggested it was basically a done deal. The trade show also, at following the the retailer part of the trade show, they were going to open up to consumers for consumers to come in and buy gear from the manufacturers. Which, if you're a retailer, is a kick in the nuts. There's no other way to put it. Uh, it. it, it uh, so anyway, the phones have been my my phones been ringing off the hook for the past week of people, you know, <laughs> calling and asking what we're going to do. And the and the answer is we don't know what we're going to do. Here's my prediction. My prediction is that these three big boat companies, I think a lot of them are looking at Whitewater kind of in the rearview mirror. It's been nothing but grief for them. You know, these these companies are continued they're continued they're going to be they're you they're continuing to hitch their fortunes to, to fishing kayaks, as far as I can tell. And they're going to go to ICAST, which is a fishing trade show, as a primary trade show. They're not really going to take paddle sports, as we know it, that seriously. Um, a bunch of the soft goods manufacturers, we're going to have to fend for ourselves at this point. I don't know that we're going to go to a trade show anymore. Why does this matter to consumers and all the listeners out there who aren't in the industry? Here's the thing, right? Is that for paddle sports to really work and to get back to where it was and have the best customer experience and to see growth in the sport, we have to have retailers involved, right? A centralized trade show where you can meet retailers and retailers can see the product line, like outdoor retailer where you can see not only paddle sports but everything else. You know, these threads are being cut, right? Uh, you know, the boat companies aren't that super interested in making whitewater boats anymore. The retailers are getting out. There's no more trade show. It's very hard to make a living. It's just getting harder and harder and harder to make this thing work. Um, I was talking about this with my buddy Chase, who's a, who's a, who's a very smart money guy in New York, and he's also a, a really good kayaker. 
And, you know, he pointed out, he's probably right, that sooner or later the marketplace will adjust. And, you know, we're going to see we're going to see things come back to an even keel. But I'll tell you how it's going to look. And I think we both agree on this is that you're going to see far fewer choices in Whitewater. Well, right? that's evident with the consolidation that's going on. I mean, that's right. You're going to see far fewer choices in Whitewater and you're going to see far less innovation. I mean, you're going to see the same boats around for many, many years. Um, the idea that we're going to see kids boats being made or big guy boats being made. I think those days are for the foreseeable future and are gone. And you're going to see a dramatic, a dramatic price increase on gear across the board, which needs to happen anyway. And all um, these things to me smell like less and less of a need for an industry trade show. It makes the trade show less value. If, if you're only going to go to the trade show to see the new color skews, I mean, do you really need to go do that? Well, I mean, the bigger issue, the bigger issue with the trade show, and this is to me, this is the root of the problem, is that there's no sense to go to it. The reason you go to a trade show is for a set for 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 a, a economy of scale, right? A, a manufacturer like IR in in the best years would see seventy or eighty stores at a trade show, right? And it was a very economical way to see a bunch of people. If you can't see a bunch of people at the show, and there's a whole bunch of other benefits too, because retailers get to go see everything from Petzl to Black Diamond to Patagonia to all their boats to everything all in one place. It's very convenient for them also. But in paddle sports, if retailers, if there are no retailers and retailers aren't going to this thing, there's no reason to have a trade show. Exactly right. The reason why, and we can't talk about really have a good conversation about a trade show for paddle sports until we fix the core problem in paddle sports, which is nobody's making money, particularly retailers. Um, and there's two problems. There's two problems we have that are endemic in this industry. One, our margins for these retailers are terrible. If you buy a whitewater kayak and you sell, you have, you really have to have a screw loose to be selling whitewater kayaks right now in the United States. The, the little amount of money you make from them, right? Uh, when you sell a boat for a thousand dollars, you're making you're you're making one hundred fifty dollars or something after ever after everything's involved. That's a terrible return on investment. It's not sustainable. Um, you know, you have these retailers have to make money. That's the first problem. The second problem is, and this is endemic across the entire outdoor industry and probably well beyond, is the pro dealing is out of control, right? Um, Literally anybody can get a pro deal in paddle sports and until we fix those two things We're not gonna have a retailer base, right? How do you know that? that? I mean, how do you square that with some of the conversations we've had about like how? You know pro dealing is such a huge part of the outdoor industry, right? It's sort of just like multi-tiered it's pricing. Huge. It's huge. It's huge and 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 you know this is man you know you could say chicken or the egg you know the retailers started falling off so the manufacturers had to open up a new sales channel to sell stuff to customers and they just what they did is they opened up the the pro deal channel wide open right and and if a manufacturer looks at it this way a manufacturer is like you know on the surface ostensibly we're losing sales to retailers so we can replace that with a pro deal program Right. And pro deal programs are great because it's, it's somewhere close to wholesale pricing. You're making the same amount of money from a pro deal customer as you are you off of a retailer. However, it's a net zero. Right. You mean meaning you get paid right away. Most most manufacturers sell stuff to stores. They don't get paid for 30 or 60 or more days. And especially if the stores are chronically late, of which there are many, you know, sometimes it could be months and months before you get paid. But with a pro deal customer, you get paid with a credit card instantly. On the surface, it's a great you know, it's 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 a very short term answer to a money problem, right? But the big picture is is that the more pro dealing you do, the less incentives retailers have to sell your product, and you devalue the you devalue the price of your product, right? I mean, the going the, the market value for a dry suit nowadays is what eight eight hundred dollars, right? Nine hundred dollars maybe. That's not enough. That's not enough. Uh, dry suits are really really hard to make, and they're really hard to service, right? Um, and furthermore, our sport is so small, we have to pay a lot for these things. Like we go to these factories to make these things or the fabric manufacturer or the people that make the waterproof zippers, right? And they're used to selling tens of thousands of something to a customer like Burton or Patagonia. We come up to them and show them the numbers we're making. And it's a shock that they even want to answer our emails. That's so small. And we pay dearly for that. When you order the small amount of stuff and make the small amount of stuff that we make as difficult as to make, it costs a fortune to make that stuff, right? So the, so the fact that our sport is so small compounds this price situation considerably. If I was selling a million dry suits a year, okay, yeah, $800, we could make that work. But that's not the case, right? It's far from the case. So I know this sounds like a repeat of, of last last week's show or last, last episode, but, uh, you know, that's... 
that's what's going on. But it's um, it, it's it's a recap with everything we talked about coming to fruition. That's right. Know? So it's it's a little more <laughs> than a recap at this point. I, right. Geltman was talking about his anger with with buyers, which you may want to follow up on, and you know, but he came on the show knowing that Confluence was, was at the end of the rope, end of the line, right? Oh yeah, for sure. But you know, he was between a rock and a hard place. We'll give him that. Right. Sort of Lewis's point. I mean, rather than be a conglomerate of investors that pulled their money from Saudi Arabia and everything that Confluence has been through over the years, they're now held by a private company. It could be, um, I mean, like a company that's in the recreation industry, at least. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys have more inside information than you want to share right now or what, but I guess I heard that and I was like hopeful. I was you know, I mean, listener uh, reaction to the not to the contrary. I mean, we're all rooting for Dagger here, right? Like, we want to see oh yeah these guys stay in business and keep making kayaks. And like, I don't know. I mean, I guess I saw that and I was like, oh. I mean, personally, I'm rooting for the Joe Pulliam Dagger, right? Where Joe Pulliam was, or the Bill Masters perception, right? I mean, the, I mean, back that's in the, the day when these, when these companies like... were run by boaters, right? And when I mean by boaters, they weren't. They actually like kayaking and they actually <laughs> like whitewater and they had a vested interest in whitewater doing well and making boats, you know, and their family kayaked and, you know, that, but evidently for the, at least for the foreseeable future, those, those days are gone. Um, at least in the U S as far as the big show, the big boat show, what's it called? The big gear show, the big gear show. Um, yeah. You know, a positive could be that maybe it's leverage for outdoor retailer to lower some of their entry prices. Um, let me ask you this, Weld. Has there ever the, the, been any talk? Okay, cut me off if, if I'm speaking no, out go of ahead. here. No, no, go ahead. Has there ever been any talk within the paddle sports industry to essentially collective bargain space on the floor there to get a better deal? Is there? Has everybody ever got together and said, hey, rather than create a whole new show, um, you know, let's uh, you know, let's all get together and see if we can get like a half price on a corner of the building. No, when when Pat, well, first of all, the the big gear show is, I, I mean, my opinion is probably from what I can tell is dead in the water unless there's something happening in the bike industry that I don't know about because I, I don't think my bike the bike's part part of the show, but I, I'm not seeing this thing get pulled off, and I'm I'm seeing the paddle sport show or paddle sport companies going to a trade show outside of iCast and the fishing sh- iCast is a fishing show if I hadn't pointed that out. I don't think we're going to any show. Uh, to answer your question about pricing, um, no, you know, I mean, when outdoor retailer worked, you know, 10, 15 years ago when it was still a functioning thing, it was worth every penny. You know, it was expensive, but still, when you could see, like I said, upwards of 100 stores at a show, it was an issue. When we left the trade show, the people who organized outdoor retailer offered us half price booths, you know, half, half price uh, real estate in there and other things. Um, okay elder incentives but you know the 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 problem we have right now is i think is what i mentioned earlier you know in terms of the of the pricing and the fact that we're all losing money i mean paddles if you look at if you look how much money those three companies we just mentioned have lost in the past 15 years tens of millions of dollars they've lost what do you think of, and it's, it's somebody else's money too for the most part it's some investor or someone's running a charity a whitewater a very <laughs> underground shadow whitewater charity has put millions and millions of dollars into the sport for nothing you know, we'll never see a return on that. Well, Do you sure. think you would go back to, to OR? Uh, if, y- yeah, sure. I would, I would in a heartbeat. I mean, this is a complicated question, but for me, you know, s- say we could, if, if I were in charge, right, I would say, you know, the litmus test for a trade show for me is two simple questions. One, are we reducing the number of trade shows that we're going to, right? No one wants to go to 10 trade shows. That's dumb. And having having you know a paddle sport show and a big gear show and outdoor retailer and the ERA trade shows all those things we need to be reducing trade shows. So whatever we go to is it is a reduction in number of trade shows or an increase in our trade shows? Uh, is increase that's a non-starter for me. The second thing is we need to go shows open to everybody, right? Not Eastern Rep trade show where it's just the East Coast or GOA, which is sort of an alliance of retailers, which is once again is more or less a group of East Coast retailers. It needs to be open to every single retailer in the country, right? Uh, and that show exists. It's outdoor retailer. It, did, it has the benefit of having every big outdoor company in the world there, right? Um, as well as people like yourself, Lewis, who go there, and all my vendors are there. 
Um, there's a timing issue, and man, retailers don't want to go to this out to retailer show because they claim the timing is wrong, and it's in June, and they say that they don't know what they're going to sell in June. But this new you show know. is just going to be 20 days later or something, right? Yeah, it's like three weeks later, and that was another problem. In fact, retailers have with it, that show um, is the timing of the show. I, I think that's a disingenuous argument. I know re, re, we have a lot of retailers who are listen. You, you know, the the fact of the matter is, is that. Um, like IR right now is working on 2021, right? We're, we're designing and getting ready to buy the 20 gear for 2021, right? So we're already spending money on this as we speak for, for a, a whole, a full year and some change from now. So we would go to a show in June with stuff already made based or being made. It'll be in the factory being made. We don't know what we're going to sell, but we're taking a big guess and a big risk. Uh, you know, retailers just have to get on, in my opinion, have to get on board that, with that idea that they're going to go in and take the same kind of risk that we're taking, right? That's what we do. We we make money through taking risks, right? Oh, I'd also so like to tricky. think. I'd also like to think if you've been in the retail business for more than a year, you have a pretty good idea of what you're going to sell. You know, you know you're going to sell ten playboats or fifteen playboats. I realize water in California and stuff like that's an issue, but it's just that's just the thing. I mean, there's nothing we can do about it. We have these trade shows in September, right? Like this big this big gear show. All the stuff that we're making for 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 2021 will will be in our building in, by September. The retailer's input means nothing at that point, zero, not a thing. They could order, they could preseason order all they want. They're gonna take what we've already have. And the sense for manufacturers at that point is like, at least from soft goods, boats are a different thing. The soft goods are like, what do we, what do we need you for? You know, we're if we're gonna if we're buying all the stuff, you're not putting any input into it or risking inventory, and you're barely writing a preseason. We're holding all of the inventory. We're just going to put the gas on these direct sales things and initiatives like pro dealing, you know, um, it's a dysfunctional system for sure. But to answer your question, yeah, I'd go back to auto retail in a heartbeat. If, if, if we could see enough show, uh, retailers there. The thing about paddle sports retailer that I always thought was, uh, just working with various shops, Southern raft supply. Let's just take Southern raft supply. Um, for instance, the lovely Sarah Rose Brooks manages that shop. Justin Thompson, who's the manager there at Watershed. They're kind of a collaboration. And at Outdoor Retailer, they found the one wheel. Now, I know this has nothing to do with you, John, but at, from, a, from a retailer's hat, putting on the retailer's hat, going to a show, they don't just want, they want to see, you know, they've got their consumer base and they want to see what else they can sell them, not just the new color skew of whatever spray skirt, you know what I'm saying? So if you're robbing them of that, I mean, you know, SRS is selling, I don't know how many pallets of one wheels they sell, hundreds and hundreds. They're the biggest one wheel dealer in the United States now. That never could have happened if they went to a trade show where they never got to see that. So it seems to me- Well, the truth is, is they they go to a retailer and they go to a paddle sport show. Right or a lot of people do, and they should because that's where, like for the but reason you just explained. But it's just like what you were saying. How many shows are you going to send them to? You know, you were right. drunk. You know, so indeed, I, I don't know. It's a tricky combination. It reminds me this big show, the big gear show. It reminds me of a radio station that jumps from country music to classic rock to rap to whatever that nobody's ever going to listen to. But. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I think the big gear show, beer, the big gear show is dead in the water. I don't think it's going to get off the ground. So I think that's the end of that. My opinion, we'll see. I could be dead wrong. I I'm not. Oddly enough, Sutton and Darren did not reach out to me or many other manufacturers about this. They just announced it. Um, so hmm. maybe maybe there's something I don't. But. Well, speaking of people who know things that we don't. Um, Let's bring on anonymous boat review guy and uh, see if he has some insider information about all of the mergers and acquisitions that are uh, currently. This could not come at a better time. He's going to offer us clarity that we desperately need in these troubled times. I agree. I agree. So let me see here if I can add him. <clears throat> Get him on the line here. I know that uh, anonymous boat review guy has been um, anonymous boat review guy. Are you there? Yeah. Hey guys. <laughs> <laughs> hey ABRG. Uh, it's been a long time. How have you been? Good. Glad to be back on the show. See, Weld's been stealing my thunder. Someone needs to get a voice modulator. <laughs> 
Well, you know Hammer Factor isn't streamed live, right? Grace can edit this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and sometimes I have to wield that pen. Um, yeah. uh -oh. Someone needs to get that guy a PR rescue course. <laughs> <laughs> ABRG, you're back on the show. How have you been? How have you been? Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, there's a lot to unpack here. Okay, well, let's start from the top. How about EJ being ousted from Jackson Kayak? <laughs> Listen, we all know that EJ's role at Jackson has always been ceremonial. We're talking about a guy that let his dog drive his motorhome. <laughs> About the only decision they let that guy make is coming up with boat names. <laughs> okay, okay. How about Dagger? Well, Dagger, as we know it, it's over. Sold to a foreign mega corporation that sells cheap wreck boats at Dick's Sporting Goods. Wait, wait, wait. Is it really that bad? Can you give me a no. little more context here on the sale of Dagger? Well... Dagger has produced some of the most iconic boats in Whitewater. The RPM, the Nomad, they led the longboat revolution and the freestyle revolution before that. And of course, the Dagger family is a storied history of Whitewater legends. Yep, yep, we had Joe Pulliam on the show. Yo, well, I'm not sure who Joe is, but I'm talking about the people at the center of Dagger. For starters, you've got Paul Vigiano. To pursue his passion, Paul walked away from a cushy m and job at Goldman Sachs. He eventually found what he was looking for at Dagger and the rest of the Confluence family. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Paul? <laughs> uh, well, many of your listeners might not realize that before Pelican was subsumed, uh, or before Pelican subsumed Dagger into its behemoth foreign megacorporation, Dagger was owned by a small business headquartered right here in the USA, outside Whitewater Mecca, New York City. <laughs> wait, 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 Confluence is down the road in Greenville, South Carolina. That's correct, but the hedge fund that owned Confluence is based in Connecticut. Paul Vigiano, the managing director, he poured his heart and soul into Confluence for several quarters before dumping it through an M&A bank to Pelican. <laughs> Wait a sec. Confluence was owned by a hedge fund? Yes. Technically, it's a private equity firm. It's called J.H. Whitney. But let's not get hung up on Paul. There are plenty of other characters in the Dagger family to focus on. Let's talk about a name most of your listeners will know. Andy Zimmerman. <laughs> okay, okay, of course. Let's talk about Andy Zimmerman. Okay, well, Andy, he's a boater's boater. Like most hardcore kayakers that will paddle any kayak brand except Jackson, Zimmerman has owned every kayak brand except Jackson. Andy, is, he's really the guy that made Dagger what it is today. A small asset in a medium-sized portfolio of outdoor brands. <laughs> From the sound of it, it sounds like Dagger's been a corporate brand for some time. Yeah, but these were American corporations. Well, at least since Zimmerman bought Watermark from Crescent Capital Investments, a subsidiary of the Bank of Islam. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. We had buyers on the show, and he said that it was just a rumor Watermark was owned by the Bank of Islam. Well, the thing about rumors is that sometimes they're true. Kind of like the time Weld shared that rumor of troubles at Confluence. <laughs> Oh, God. Okay. Well, I don't know what else. I don't know. ABRG. Uh, maybe we'll have to bring you on with some reviews or something, but we got a whole apology show coming after this, so I think we're going to let you go, my man. All right. Well, hey, let's talk about getting you a voice modulator the next time you hear an industry rumor and want to share it. Seriously. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. Uh, Thank you, ABRG. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what to say about that. <laughs> well, he's saying what we're all thinking, maybe, right? <laughs> uh, we got to get him back on some boat reviews. 
but yeah. Uh, but that was good. That was good. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta send to some love ABRG ways. <laughs> <laughs> oh, guys. Well, should we transition here to our special guest on the show? Sort of when I talked about the show notes, I. Some of my lines here talked about, uh, you know, the black hole of paddle sports and some various other things that I brought together. But we also have some shining stars. And one of those is young Evie Liebfarth. Am I saying that right, Lewis? I believe so. Okay. Um, can you give a quick intro to Evie while I try to get her on the line here, Lewis? Yeah, uh, I can try. I... All I know about Evie is that she is, well, she is uh, uh, the daughter of someone I raced with growing up, which makes me feel old. Um, <laughs> but she's, I believe, 15 years old, you said, Grace? Yep. And she has been just, like, absolutely smashing uh, in the international slalom scene this year. Uh, it's my recollection that you're not actually allowed to race senior world cups until you're 14 or 15 years old. So she wasn't even allowed to race world cups until I think partway through this season. And she promptly showed up and started making finals. And I believe meddling in world cups this summer, you know, at an incredibly young age and, you know, wait, we Psalm. It's not, uh, this isn't like gymnastics or something where showing up at 15 and, you know, really being in the mix with the absolute top of the sport is, is usual in any way. So, you know, pretty amazing. You know, we've gone through some, you know, a pretty down time in slalom racing in the U.S. for, you know, going on probably 20 years now, honestly, 15 years. And to you know just following her and you know her junior teammates honestly from afar this summer has been really inspiring cool to see the uh the u.s junior women's team all three girls made the final at junior worlds which is again i mean like if you don't follow the international fall and like it's hard to grasp like how how hard that is to do i mean for you know three u.s women to be in the in the top 10 at I don't know if that's ever happened before. So, did you guys that's... lose me? <clears throat> I lost you for just a second, but it's all good. Did you lose me there? I lost you for just a second, but you're back. Cool. Yeah, I mean, just like really like unprecedented sick results from Evie as well as from, uh, I think it was Madison Corcoran and uh, Rhea Srivar this summer at Junior Worlds. And then... You know, Abby is crushing at the senior level at a really young age, like in kayak NC1. So pretty, pretty excited to have her on and, and talk about this kind of like renaissance that these girls are leading in, in U.S. law. That's all fine and good, but where does she stand on Palace Sports Retailer and MSRP pricing? <laughs> ABRG just figured all that out. <laughs> all right, I'm going to see if I can get her on right now. All right. So real quick, I'm going to give a quick intro here before we dive into it. Um, okay. We have, how do I say your last name? Liebforth? Liebforth? Liebforth. Liebforth. Evie Liebforth is, is a, what was that, Lewis? I was going to ask if it was Evie, not Evie. It's Evie, right? It's Evie, yeah. Evie, yeah. <laughs> Evie Liebforth is a U.S. slalom team member and 15-year-old paddler from Bryson City, North Carolina. She currently turned heads this year, placing fourth in the world championship, beating out a host of seasoned veterans. Welcome to the show, Evie, and how are you doing? Thanks for inviting me on. It's so great to be here. I'm doing really great today. How about you? Uh, we're doing pretty good. We just had an interesting discussion about the state of the paddle sports industry. It was kind of uh, gloom and doom, so we're excited for you to kind of pick <laughs> us up here a little bit. Hmm. <laughs> um, before we dig into this interview, can you share something with our audience that most people don't know about you? Um, I really enjoy art. Um, you'll see me by the side of the river painting what I see. Um, or painting at the top of a mountain. It's really just a hobby that I do 
in between training um, and going out to places. Sweet. So you're a bit of an artist. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's start from the beginning. Where are you from and how did you get into this sport? I'm from Bryson City, North Carolina. Um, I've lived here my whole life. And my father, Lily Barth, was a canoe slalom coach before I was born. Um, so when I turned four, he got me in the kayak for the first time, and I just loved it. And since then, I've been pursuing it. Um, when I'm home, I train at the Nantahala Outdoor Center on the Nantahala River. Um, but I also travel for most of the year with my family. Okay. And is this traveling to competitions and that kind of thing? Yeah, traveling to train, to competitions. Um, there are artificial whitewater courses all over the world. So this year I've been to one in Australia, all over Europe, and I even got to go to one in Japan, uh, the Olympic course in Tokyo. Sick of How's that? It's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I really like the course, and then the city is just so huge and so different from anywhere I've been. But I think that's a really cool part of the slalom is that you get to see all these different cultures as you travel around. Did slalom always stick out to you as the part of kayaking that you were into? Or is that something that later you got into? Were you always focused on slalom? Um, I started really training slalom when I was about 10 years old. Before that point, I did freestyle, creaking, um, even flat water. I just kind of tried out all the disciplines to find what I liked. Um, and then and before I kayaked, I was actually a gymnast. Um, so for a while I thought that that was my passion and that's what I wanted to go to the Olympics in someday. Um, and that really grew a love for paddling. Gymnast. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah, you paddle both C1 and K1. Is that normal within the slalom discipline or is this kind of just your thing? I think you can go 50-50. A lot of the top competitors do both, and I think it's because skills transfer a lot between the two. But I like it just because it's variety, um, and it really gives you a different feel on each course, so you, you never get bored. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot, of, a lot of the women do it, especially because it's such a new discipline. I think maybe people will start to specialize closer to 2024. Do you do most of your training in, in Bryson City? Is that where you like do the, the bulk of your workouts? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, this year, I've only been home for like a month and a half. Um, I've been all over. But oh, wow. yeah, and as I'm home, I'll also be doing some freestyle and some river running just to mix it up a bit. Is your dad your, the, your primary coach? Yes, for sure. Um, he has been since I was little. And how does that work? I mean, do you think that's a good dynamic? I mean, it's or at some point you're just like, I. I'm getting sick of him and I need to, I need to get sick of my daddy and branch out a little bit. And... I think for me, it's a great dynamic. I have a lot of people ask me like, oh, how's that like? Um, yeah. But I'm just so lucky to have a coach who's always with me. Right. And because he's my dad, he really knows me and he knows how to push me to do my best. Um, right. So I've been really lucky to have a family who's so supportive of my racing. So my wife raced slalom back in the day, and at that point, you know, she she was uh, born in Pennsylvania, in kind of the middle of nowhere, somewhat similar to Bryson City, but she ended up going to school in uh, in Maryland, so she could train at Brookmont, and that's where the U.S. team coach was. And yeah, you know, slalom. Is there an equivalent to that going on right now, like maybe in Atlanta or something, where you have a U.S. team coach? Um, um, I think in Charlotte. Yeah. Um, that's the main U.S. National Training Center. We've got the bulk of our athletes there. Um, but my dad also coaches for the national team. So I guess we have a group here at NOC also. So how many people do you train with every day? I mean, you're training every day when you're here? Is that, or like, what's your workout schedule like? Um, yeah. Well, I'm here. I'll typically do like four workouts on whitewater a week. And yeah. then I'll also balance it with flat water, um, running, mountain biking, um, and then gym workouts. Right. And how big is your crew there? How many people do you have uh, paddling slalom with you? Probably about six people every time. Um, we've got a lot of younger athletes who are just getting to the sport, which is right. so great to see. Um, it's really promising for the growth of slalom. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it really depends who's in town 
fun because a lot of my friends who trained with me are also traveling and sometimes their schedules don't match up. Right. How young are these these people you're training with? Um, some of them are between like nine and 12. Oh, cool. Um, just getting into the sport. And then there are a lot of people a little bit older than me, like 16, 17, 18, um, who I've been training with for as long as I can remember. And you guys are training at the gates in that section down there below Nantahala Falls, mostly? Yes. Um, once a year, we'll have a race at the Nantahala Falls. Um, so it's a little bit bigger. Um, but yeah, most of the time we're training at the bridge gates. And so how much do you, how much do you spend time in a kayak versus a C1? I mean, is it 50, 50 or are you typically in a kayak more often? I'm in a kayak more often, probably about 60% of the time in kayak, 40% in C1. Right. Um, it kind of depends what time of the season it is. If I'm training more to do better in C1 or K1, but generally I feel that K1 transfers more to C1. Yeah. So even as I'm training K1, I am helping my C1 skills. I should I should point out, and it seems almost a shame that I have to, but C1 is a one-person canoe. You, paddle, you kneel on these things and you paddle with a canoe paddle. This, it's so moribund in whitewater that I'm sure there's whitewater paddlers out there who have never actually seen a C1 in person. Uh, but in the well, Solemn community, it's, it's a legitimate it's, thing. I mean, you go to yeah, international Solemn races, it's um, a very robust actually, community. C1 women is a fairly new discipline. It's right. just coming into the Olympics in 2020. So we're having a lot of people start doing it for the first time. Right. And I'm hoping that that'll spread to river running and freestyle also. Um, so when my, when my wife raced, they didn't have a women's C1. It's my understanding that in a sense of equity, they wanted to have the same number of classes for men and for women as well. And so there was a men's C1 class. And then recently, a few years ago, they opened up a women's C1 class. Is that, do I have that yes, story right? Yes, of course. And I think that that marks a lot of progress for the sport. Um, before the next Olympics uh, quad, I guess. Right. Um, like in 2016, there was C1 men, K1 men, and C2 men, and only K1 women. So um, the governing body said, hey, we need more women in the sport, and we need to make it balanced. So they removed the C2 men and put in C1 women. So now they're the same amount of men and women athletes. Uh, so that's right. what you meant by C1 being a new thing. It's a new yeah. thing. In yeah. The slalom. Okay. Yeah, I'll so point C1 out. It's a new thing. I noticed that you you medal. Did you medal at Tassin in Slovenia? I did. Um, and it was C1. Really, yes, it okay. was a crazy experience for me. <laughs> for the record, I would get my ass beat in the first five feet at Tassin <laughs> in the C1. There would be no surviving that. There would be it, throwing hard darkening course. the skies, pulling me out of that course if I was in the C1. <laughs> I just hit my shoulder. Yes, yeah, so actually, like, literally the session broke up race at Tassin. <laughs> session before my first run at the world cup there um yeah. i went down the top drop and i got stopped by a hole and i just had an awful surf and i ended up breaking my boat yeah. um so it was just kind of a rough way to start the race um and then i was just able to pull it together and have actually a good race but it's definitely a really hard start to the race because you just go over this horizon line and then you're in the mix of it Right, you all, you listeners should look it up. Look up the the Tossin course on, on YouTube. It's 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 a it's a great course if you like whitewater. Would you say? I mean, most American boaters seem to have a strong suit in whitewater. Just say that's the case for yourself. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, the artificial courses we have in the U.S. It's Charlotte, which I think a lot of recreational paddlers have been to. Um, Oklahoma City, where the, the um, paddle sport conference I believe was held this year. Mm -hmm. um, and then Dickerson and DC. I um, mean, all, all right. of these are as big as the biggest horses in New York, in Europe. So we all have some strong skills there. Right. Let's talk about the health of slalom in the U.S. because it's gone through a bit of a dry, dry spell. Um, what's your sense in the slalom community in the U.S.? Are we growing? Is we have a chance? I mean, I, how does it? I think what, we have a chance. Um, I think we're definitely growing. Um, we've got some strong paddling programs in Washington, D.C. and here at NOC, getting more kids into it, which really, really helps the growth of the sport. And then in 2028, we'll have the Olympics in Los Angeles. And I think that that's a really good opportunity to build some excitement for the sport um, since it's going to be in the U.S. and people can actually watch it. 
right? Um, what's your? It, it seems like slalom works in Europe. And what's what's the difference? Do you think? Like, what do they have right that we don't in term in that regard? Is it what's is it a cultural thing or what's your take on that? I think that they've got a lot more beginner programs in the U.S. We don't have a lot of programs that focus on like flat water and skill development. We've got more just um, getting on white water as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. Where in Europe, they have big programs of kids just working on flat water to build those necessary skills um, mm-hmm. before they actually get on white water. So there's a much better progression there, and right. there are enough kids to do it that way. Uh, I was sharing this with these guys when we were trying to get you on there earlier, but it was just like so cool to see. Um, I was like sitting out here watching the live stream of Junior Worlds with. Scotty Parsons, who's like a legendary American slalom paddler, and Isaac Levinson, who raced slalom for a bunch of years. Yeah. I'm so fired up to see how well, especially in the women's kayak class, you and your your teammates did in that race. It was just like such a breath of fresh air. Pretty, pretty down years for U.S. slalom, just to see the three of you all in the final and racing so well, like, do you guys, uh, do you guys attribute that much or like, what do you attribute that success that you all have started to build? Um, I think that this year we had a really good team. We all really supported each other in training. So we were able to push each other in a competitive way, but still, um, really be friendly on the water. And I think that kind of uh, team really helped us all build our skills going into the junior worlds. Um, so yeah, I think we could all attribute that to just working together to build um, better technique and better speed. So it's my understanding that you, until you reach the age of 15, you have to compete in the junior level. Is that correct? No, actually, you're not allowed to compete as a junior until you're 15. Um, so this was my first year I could even the junior team. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, so you're considered a cadet if you're under 15. And so like last summer I was doing a series called the, um, uh, the Cadet ECA Cup Circuit, um, which is just a series of races in Europe um, meant for younger kids to really get them introduced into the international racing scene um and then i was really psyched this year that i was finally old enough to make the junior and the senior team um so when i qualified that it was great because i knew that i could actually race the world championships and the world cups okay very cool and so were you chomping at the bit to get in there and race some of these like senior ladies or were you hesitant about it what were you thinking when you were watching them race I was really excited to last year I watched the world championships in Ivry um, and it was really hard not being able to compete but I'm happy that this is my first year because it's the first year where I was actually competitive with those top ladies so you go to Europe to race what's the European race circuit like like when do you leave and when and, and when do you come back what's it's a pretty it's a pretty long calendar of racing if I remember correctly yeah, it is. So this year I did both senior and junior races. So I was there most of the summer. Oh. I left the U.S. in early um, April, mm-hmm. early April to go over and compete in the first two World Cups and the Junior Worlds. Right. And then I came back to the U.S. for just a week. I went to Peru for the Pan American Games, mm-hmm. um, which only happens every four years. And then I flew back to Europe for another two months until the end of September. Um, So it really spans a long period of time. It gives you enough time to prepare in between events and get used to the different courses. So how does sponsorship work in regards to, you know, sponsorship and being part of the Olympic um, roster of teams? Like how does the Olympic Committee dictate what sponsors you can have and how does that that pan out? Um, I'm honestly not... not sure yet. Um, my current sponsors are in the Hill Outdoor Center. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been paddling and I've been part of that community for so long. So that's a really good partnership. Um, and I've also partnered with Gallusport, which makes slalom boats right. and um, really great paddles, even for river running and freestyle. Um, and the main thing with the Olympics is that you can't have sponsorship logos showing. 
Right. Um, so it definitely makes it a bit harder to get sponsors because you want them, but you can't exactly advertise them except when you're talking about them. Right. Yeah, it's been a while. I know Kara was dealing with this towards the end of her career. It's been a long time since I've been part of that, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your strong point in terms of slalom racing? And what's, what's, what's your strongest suit? I mean, you come in, I mean, what, what do you think you're, you're good at when you, when you show up at an international race? Um, I think that I'm really good at just diving right in. I didn't know what to expect this year, yeah. um, but I just, I keep myself excited about it and I just love the sport. So that really keeps me going. But more like regards to like a skill set. Like what's your. Um, I have. I'm really quick. Um, yeah. My strokes aren't that strong. But they're yeah. really, really quick. Um, a lot of people say it's like a hummingbird. Yeah. Um, so that just allows me to accelerate um, throughout my run. And I think that's really what's allowed me to do so well this year. And what, do you, what are we working on? Like what's, what's something you feel like to really to really charge you need to you need to develop i'm working on my strength right now yeah. um like aerobic capacity for sure um running and sprint paddling but mm -hmm. most of the time i am in the gym working on just building strength and then transferring that into my stroke that's really right. important for the coming year is it possible to train in europe would you feel like if you could train in europe you could like i know american cyclists would go train in europe just because the depth of field is so much bigger right yeah it's really great to have such a full training group in Europe. Um, and one of the best parts about racing the World Cups is that you get to watch the other paddlers yeah. in their training sessions. Um, right. And you learn so much from watching. And I'm sure it's the same in the other disciplines, but just especially so in slalom. Um, but yeah, I think anytime I get an opportunity to train there or in Australia, I really improve. Australia because of... Um, yeah, um, Fox. Jessica Fox, yeah, that's... Um, yeah, so there's a race called the Australian Open there every year, mm -hmm. and almost all the international paddlers come there um, right. to train for about one or two months. So there's, like, almost a World Cup field there. Um, you said that you used to race slalom? Me, no. Uh, my, my wife was uh, on the U.S. slalom team for a number of years. Uh, that is, this would be like 1925 <laughs> to 1930s in that era. Kara's going to be listening to this, John. It was like a big hole, but with like a 400-centimeter paddle. Oh, my gosh. I don't know about Kara. Um, she would have raced. She, the I think Olympics. she was racing just before your dad was racing, if I remember correctly. Uh, okay. So she would have been with All like right. Kathy Hearn, Donna Klodek, um, that generation. Got it. Right. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, that team used to go over to Australia also. I'm not really sure how recent that wasn't it a thing is. Yet. That wasn't a thing. Yeah. Where is the camp built for, for the 2000 Olympics, was it? So, yeah, yeah, correct. So like, in, the, in the 90s, it okay. was everybody, went, like, everybody went to like Cozy in the winter in the 90s. It's kind of like okay. the winter spot. Yeah. I know that um, Solomon was actually <laughs> almost taken out of the 2000 Olympics, and then um, there was just a big push to get the whitewater course built there, and it really saved the sport, so I think it's such an interesting venue. I want to throw a theory by you and see what you think about this, right? Um, I've heard from a number of people who race Solomon that they felt like the becoming an Olympic sport hurt, ultimately hurt the sport because it's it was a, it's almost unattainable number the number of boats that actually participate in the olympics most people were just like it's not worth training for four years to miss that mm -hmm. whereas when it was just a world cup sport you know you could make you know the a team and still travel to europe and even the b team would go to europe and race right yeah it's a lot um, more in, in, inclusive you know a lot more a lot more people were involved what do you, th yeah. do you think there's some truth to that or no i think there's a little bit of truth to it but i think that the main part to that is people's mindsets towards it. Um, the Olympics is a really cool thing, and it's brought a lot of media attention to the sport. Yeah. Um, and it, it's great to go there um, and get that experience, but also it's not the only race. I mean, the world championships are almost every year, and they're hugely important. And I think that all the top athletes and athletes from Europe really regard that as the main event because everyone can go there and not everyone can go to the Olympics. Right. Um, so I think that people really have to put the same pressure on themselves for the World Cups and the World Championships that they would the Olympics. 
right. in order to keep themselves engaged and just give themselves something to work towards, even if it's not the Olympics. So, so what's the no. mechanism for, for a U.S. paddler to race in the World Cup? It's not like you can just buy a plane ticket and show up and start racing. You have to be part of the U.S. team, right? So how does that, how yeah, does that work? So you have to, um, we have two team trials every year generally. Mm -hmm. um, this year they're in Oklahoma and you've got to be one of the top three boats mm -hmm. um, in your class um, and you have got to make a certain percentage um, right. so even if there aren't three really fast boats you've still got to be a certain percentage off the top male kayak I see so it's, um, the percentage is then, set off of the fastest boat regardless of gender yes it okay. is um, it's class adjusted so it differs for each class but there's still that um, that really high point to reach for. Um, so then once you make the team, um, you can go to Europe and train with a national team coach like Rolfel or my dad, Lee Leapfarth. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I gotcha. And that's where the money starts rolling in too, right? That's where you start to really see <laughs> the monetary benefits of kayaking at that point. Oh, uh, yes. Just, you know, <laughs> millions for every event. <laughs> How do you juggle it all? Evie, how do you juggle the school and travel and friends and just everything that a 15-year-old is dealing with? Um, so travel and friends go together. Pretty much wherever I travel to, my friends will go also. Um, so I see them all over the world all year. So those two kind of go together. And then school, I'm online schooled. I go to K-12 International Academy. Um, so that gives me flexibility to train. And then I pretty much do it whenever I can um, whether that's early in the morning or late at night um, or just times when I'm not training hmm. Very cool. so if you're if you're 15 years old out there and you're listening to the show and I hope you're not because this can be pretty randy what how would you suggest that you get into slalom like what's the what would be the something you could do to get into slalom I think that finding a local um, kids paddling program where you could go out there with your friends and just get comfortable in a boat on flat water um, is a great first step. I started with the Nanahala Kids Club. Um, my dad coached for that. Um, and it's a way that just a lot of kids get together on the water and just have fun with it. Um, and from there, you can decide how much you like it and how much you want to train to get better. And you can set these um, periodic goals for yourself, which is super important. But overall, just having fun with it is how you're going to advance with it. Are there people out there who are, who are at least making the first steps without having a slalom course nearby? I mean, because I know a slalom course is actually kind of a rare commodity. It's hard to build. Yeah, it's, that um, and... So if you just have flat water near you, you can build so many skills. Um, just practicing turns and sprints and building your stroke technique. Mm -hmm. And then you can do slalom without gates on almost any river. Um, just practicing getting into eddies high and going around rocks. Um, and then if you decide you really want to do it, then you can go someplace like the Nanahale Outdoor Center or um, Charlotte um, to try it out on an actual course. Very cool. What about you? What about through your? I mean, you're only 15 years old, but there it hasn't all been, you know, roses and fairy tales. What are some of the ups and some of the downs that you've been through? Um. I think that something really hard for me was not being able to make the team until this year. Um, it was hard for me to keep that drive um, when I couldn't actually go out there and compete with the people I wanted to. Um, but really just finding some races in Europe that I could do um, and just getting excited about building my skills instead of competing against others um, really helped me there. Definitely, I've had some bad races. Um, and it can be hard mentally to come back from that because after you mess up, um, you're just like, well, am I good enough to keep doing this? Should I really be out here? Um, but then you've just got to remember all the ups um, and how much fun for me that I have with it. Um, and it makes it all worth it. And then just learning, learning from your failures, um, learning from bad races to find out how you can prevent it from happening next time. What about your skills? Was there ever any like breakthrough moment when you when you were like, oh, that was fast, or ooh, I'm really getting this? Is there anything that really stood out? Yes. So when I was 11 years old, I was training at NOC like I always do, and I was practicing something called a backstroke up. It's where you um you aim for an upgate 
above it and you just try and get your head around it on a backstroke. Um, and it was really hard. I kept hitting the gate and then finally I just got it and um, you use edge so your bow comes up and around and it was just so much fun and now it's my favorite upstream. <laughs> Sick. What about any other whitewater races? There's all kinds of other whitewater downriver races, uh, wild, uh, wild water races. Have you ever participated in any of those? I have. I um, I did the 2018 Wild Water Team Trials, um, and I've trained that a little bit more as cross training, but I think it's really fun to just go down a river as fast as you can, um, and definitely... After the Olympic year, I plan to do some other races, um, not not green race, <laughs> but um, like the Chloe race or something, just kind of bridging that gap between slalom and river running. Oh, you will just break some hearts out there. <laughs> I'd love to see you stomp on the green race. That would be delightful. <laughs> I would love to see that too. You know, I was I was researching this interview and I dug up a picture of you and I was like, how is this girl so fast? And then I found a video. I don't know which one it was. And you were just savage when you got in your kayak. That was really cool. I bet a lot of people <laughs> I bet a lot of people underestimate you, don't they, Effie? Um, a lot of people when they meet me, they're like, I thought you'd be taller because um, I guess that I'm really small. Um, but like I said before, my power is my speed. No. <laughs> What's next for you? I mean, obviously you're, I mean, what's, what's in the immediate future for you? Um, in about three weeks, I'm going over to Australia to train for seven weeks. Um, it'll be warm there, which I, I can't communicate how happy I am about that. <laughs> Are you guys there? Yeah, yep. we lost you for a second, but you're back. Okay. Um, so I'll go to Australia. And then I'll come back home for our team trials, our team selection um, for the Olympics. And then um, I might be heading to Tokyo after that to train. So that's what I have planned so far. <laughs> what if, if there's one of our listeners out there, whether it be a junior or somebody who's just trying to get faster, trying to just go faster in their kayak, what is the one tip you would give them? What's the one, one thing they should focus on? work on your forward stroke in flat water um you can always improve your forward stroke and even if you're incredibly strong there are always ways that you can um translate that better into your stroke and either get more pull on the water or um pull a different way and that can just that makes you so much faster with so little work mm, i like that one i'm still trying to figure out my forward stroke i think everyone is <laughs> um Boys, do you have anything else for Evie? Uh, no, no. That was really interesting, though. It's it's great to see slalom. It's great to hear from the slalom people to know that it's still out there and that it's actually we're actually making some headway here. What I like about yeah. what, what I like about this interview is just how easy. I mean, you don't have to have a great whitewater river to 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 do this sport. I mean, you, she got into it as a young kid just on flat water. What about fear of water, Evie? Have you uh, are, have you always been pretty not scared of water and white water? Um, yeah, I think I've always always just loved getting out on the river, even since I was um a little girl. But um, I think the gymnastics actually really helped me um competing in front of people. I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, it's hard to do well when you're watched. Um, but in gymnastics, I used to compete in front of a whole like stadium full of people, and I just got really used to that. So when I started doing that in kayaking, it was normal to me. Um, so I think that was scarier to me than the actual white water. Right, right. Just being in front of the crowd. Mm -hmm. Is is there anything else you'd you'd like to add before we before we conclude this interview? Um. Well, I think that even for um, white water paddlers or freestyle paddlers. Even if you don't actually want to compete in slalom, getting in a slalom boat and just working on some of those skills, um, like coming into eddies high and just um, getting tighter technique um, can really help any discipline of paddling you do. So I would encourage anyone listening to find a slalom boat nearby and just try it once. Love that. What's your What's your favorite river to run? Hmm. There's a river in Slovenia called the Socha. 
it has crystal blue water, um, and there's an upper section called Bovich, and you can run it in the slalom boat, but that's probably my favorite section of river that I've run. Um, and then also the Cascades at the Nantahala River is so much fun and so exciting. You don't awesome. take your slalom boat up there, do you? Of course not. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Damn. I'm always in a ripper for that. Very cool. Awesome. Oh, that is one more thing I'd like to mention. Mm. Um, there's a new discipline in the World Cups called Extreme Slalom, and it's basically boat across. Um, you get launched off a ramp along with four other people in a plastic boat, um, and you race down the course. Um, and I think that if anyone wanted to kind of bridge that gap between um, white water and slalom paddling, that's a great way to do it. And for um, like green racers, um, people who race on the golly, all of that, it's a great way to show your skills um, on an artificial course. And is that like a nine foot boat length restri restriction or how does that work? It is. Um, so the Piranha Ripper is a super popular boat for it. Um, it's what I use and I, everyone I know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, there um, there's a big push to get it into the Olympics for 2024, 2028. <laughs> Very cool. Which I think is really interesting. Well, where can our listeners follow you? Are you an Instagrammer or YouTuber? Where can they uh, where can they look you up? Um, I'm on Instagram as Evie Kayak. Um, very descriptive. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm also on Facebook. You can just search Ivy Leap Barth Canoe Slalom. Well, very cool. Well, thank you for taking the time to come on the show. And we'll have to have yeah, you so uh, back on after uh, some Olympics and other big competitions. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Man, that's awesome. Come on. That, that ends your doom and gloom right there, Weld. It's kind of a, a tonic to our bitter, <laughs> our bitter crustiness, right? <laughs> I talk about the exact opposite of me. Uh, like I... it's never gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> it's never gonna work. <laughs> oh man! Well, at least you recognize. I, mean, that I wanted to ask her. I, you know, I remember when Kara was racing slalom. The only thing I could really remember is like. Like store, like sick puppies, you know, where you throw the emergency brake on in a rental car somewhere in Europe. People stealing flags for World Cup races. You know, horrible you stories guys. about Jed Prince and Mike Corcoran. <laughs> <laughs> and now, now Mike's daughter is racing with Evie. <laughs> Daughters. <laughs> oh man! But she's, uh, maybe she has another couple of years before she enters that that level of racing. The hooligan face, the kicking yeah. renter car's face. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. Well, I got to tell you, it's inspiring. And we have had we have some listener mail here that talks about getting your kids into the sport and some various things. And it was just super refreshing, just all the flat water paddling. And that was kind of her intro was just paddling around on flat water. Anybody it's can always do that. It's always kind of amazing to me with the like, like the kids getting into the sport thing. Like, it's like, it seems like, you know, like, I feel like people who are, you know, parents and have kids and they're always like, oh, I wonder if my kid's going to like, like this. I'm not going to push it on them. And like, inevitably, like, kids do like it. Like, it's sweet, you know? Like, it seems like it really is like objectively sick. Like, people like who get the opportunity to like get involved in kayaking, like, like they're into it, you know, mm -hmm. like, especially if they get the opportunity to start at a young age and it's just like, we need more opportunities for, for kids to get involved, you know, man, speaking of juniors, man, we have so much more on the list here. You guys, what are we at? We haven't even got the listener mail. Oh, rants and raves. Is this going to be a two part show. Is that what we're going to do here? We may have to do this pre and post Christmas. I don't know. Um, you guys want a little green rice wrap up? Yeah, lay it on us. So, like, give us like, can we do it like thirty seconds or less? Well, all right, go. All right, so this is what I'm going to say. <laughs> I'm going to start off with this. I'm going to issue a challenge. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, actually, let's do this. What's it going to take? 
Right. Have you spoke to Max Blackburn? Have you guys both talked to Max about his time out here at the Green River Narrows race? <laughs> I got debriefed on the situation, yeah. Did he go this year? went this year. Oh, yeah. Oh, did he ever? <laughs> did he ever? I'll tell you. I, Max had a pretty, you know, he had a pretty savage line through the notch. Little upside down gorilla action. Ooh. Comes through with a broken paddle. But I will give him his two cents, dude, because he fought like nobody's business. I was watching, and he was up, and he was down, and then he rolls up with one paddle blade, goes into the hole, gets trashed in the hole, rolls back up. Right as soon as he rolls back up, Eddie Line catches him, goes back upside down. Finally, the guys grabbed him, pulled it out of the water. Before... <laughs> Does a booty beer within 30 seconds of getting drug up on the rock by the safety guys. <laughs> it was it was quite the show, I got to tell you. You got to give him big props when you see him, Lewis, because it was... It but was, he did swim. He did swim. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to see him at Chips tonight. So. <laughs> <laughs> but big thing about the race, it was, uh, number one, props to Dane and Adrian. Winning again. Dane did not break the four-minute barrier, but he did break the course record by, I think, eight-tenths of a second. Um, Another swimmer to note uh, from this year was Eric DeGill. DeGill swam. Um, This is really really undercutting Jeff Calhoun's case when we have uh, all-stars like Max Blackburn and Eric DeGill swimming. It's, like, hard to... (laughs) <laughs> hard to throw stones about beaters beaters culture calhoun, calhoun <laughs> came into ir and white salmon the other day and uh, i was busy and i looked up and he was looking kind of sheepish and i was like i think i think pat keller took your took your title for for the uh punching bag at the sport for the moment so <laughs> you can <probably> relax <laughs> <laughs> Uh, dude, it was good to see Jeff and hang out with Jeff. Jeff helped clean up at the after party, and we hung out. And I talked to Jeff about some things he could actively do. And I was like, dude, why don't you take over the Russell Fork race? It's a great course. It needs some love. You're the guy who can do it, and I think he's going to do it. So that's cool. Um, but big note about the green race, 11 juniors in the race this year. And Isaac Hull got fourth place, was one-tenth of a second behind third-place finisher Pat Keller. So I see that as a big positive. And there's something I want to run by you guys. So you know how she was just talking there on the Olympics. Evie was just talking about how you can't race until you get to 15 years old. Mm. Do you think it's fair to say you can't race the green race until you're 15? I've never oh, let. Insur- I've never let. What's your insurance anyone. company say? I've never let anyone. <laughs> I just don't really talk about it with them. I, I've never let anyone under fifteen race. Um, Isaac Hall, who's the junior champion this year, got fourth place overall. He wanted to race when he was fourteen, and I went down the river with him. And he had the skills, but he just needed a little bit more endurance. I did not let him race. So I'm thinking about, and and what I've found with some of the kids around here is they're kind of in this race to not just do the race, but to be the youngest racer ever. Mm -hmm. And that kind of worries me a little bit. And so Mm -hmm. that's a bad race. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think you should, I think you should be allowed to race at any age, but I think you're fair in giving those kids extra scrutiny. Yeah. I definitely scrutinize the heck out of them, but I would say, I would say the policy should be 15 or older, unless you, you have a committee of people that will, yeah or nay you silent vote on them <laughs> i remember i remember going to the to the russell fork race one of the one of the first years they had it when i was like 16 and i didn't have an adult there to sign my waiver and the guy who was organizing the race would not let me race and i gave him like a, a <laughs> grip of attitude about it and then i showed up at the starting line and timed myself <laughs> and how'd you do uh i was like i don't know I can't remember, honestly, but like top 10, I'm sure. Why didn't you just have somebody else <laughs> sign for you? I think he'd already seen me try or like maybe I did try <laughs> that. Like maybe Kurt Braun like signed my waiver and the guy was like, like, where's your dad? And I was like over there and they're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. But it was, dude, it was a stressful race this year. Like, you know, we had a huge drought 
There was no water in the river for a long time. I believe I talked about it a little bit on last show. And then, bam, floodgates opened up. You know what? You can say wham, but this gets back to my original proposition that I'm going to get back to here in a second. Anyway, come race day, it was a little high. Dane would have broke the record if he would have had one single practice run at the flow that we had in race day. It was pretty much a blind race for everybody. No one had had any practice at that flow. It was 12, 13 inches or something like that. Um, but this is my proposition. What's it going to take to get a Lewis Geltman and a John Weld to come out and race the green? Plane tickets. Gonna What's it going to take? <laughs> All right, I'll make a proposition. If you guys will ever schedule a date for the Little White Race, I'll come out and race the Little White Race on the caveat that you come out in the fall and race the green race. Can we make a it's deal not really, there? It's not really a fair exchange. What? How is it not a fair exchange? What are you talking you get, about? You get to come to the best whitewater race in the world, and John and I have to fly to North Carolina. I mean, <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> all, right, all, right, all right. I don't know. I would come again. I had a good time the year I went. It was fun, dude. You have. I think what it would. I think what it would take is total anonymity. That's impossible. <laughs> 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 right. Can I wear a sack over my head? <laughs> it's not gonna happen. It's Anonymous not gonna... green racer guy. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm throwing it out there. Let's see what the listeners say. Is that a fair trade or not? Let's put it out there. Especially for you, Weld. When's the last time you entered a kayak race? An upper yacht race? I don't know. It's, it's been time, a while. It's time it's been for a Coons Age. It's time for John Weld 2.0. I've run the green, and I ran the green at someone's wedding a couple of years ago. I can't remember who was getting married last time I ran the green. I ran it with Johnny Kern. You know what it would take is if we had a really good water year out here for once. Like, in a good water year, the truss is still runnable all fall, and, like, low water truss is actually, like, really good green race training. Like, I think you could, like, spec out a little course where you had – like the trot or uh, big brother, like right at the same point in the race that you would have gorilla. So you could do have like a nice, like four or four and a half minute practice mm. section with like, you know, big brother right at the right spot. And you could really get some good training in. Out here. I was, by the way, Grace, I was sold this, this, uh, this proposition that the truss ran all summer before we moved out here. Which... Well, <laughs> It's been desperate times out there. I've talked to not just you guys, but several people. I tell you what, it's not been fun. If you start capitalizing when the water is on, then you can start whinging about when the water is off. If Trust ran a day or something, <laughs> and there was all my shit Shots going fired. out there, Shots fired. I mean, seriously, it had water for like four hours. You're going to like, you're going to be like, <laughs> like, dude, I want to go. You're like, you know, skip the entire spring and then start whinging about how there's no water in July. It's like the time is now. <laughs> All right, let's read. Let's review a mail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm so, I'm so frustrated with the, the state of my kayaking right now. I don't know where to start with it. You know, we go. We got like 30 minutes of daylight left. We could wrap this thing up and go for a purple lap right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sending you a journal. Just write in there your goal. Race the green. Open it every day. Look at it, and before long, you'll be out here. All right. I'll go to the green race if Weld goes. Okay. So the, all I got to do is work on Weld then. Lewis, when are you having a little white race? Because I have to start planning for it now. It can't be like, yo, man, when the water's perfect. I think I think we're doing it in April now. April's a big like, month. Like. <laughs> what day like, in April? I think we raced April 20th last year, 420. And so that's what it's going to be, the closest Saturday to 420. Just call it the closest Saturday to 420. I will I will investigate. I will tap into all my sources and find out what the date is ahead of time and if that will get you out here. Dude, I would love to come out to that race. But I never know when it is and I can't just like Yeah, fair enough. Randomly pull it, you know. God, Little White's such a great river. Um let's jump into some listener mail here, boys. Montana Kayak Academy plug. How much hate mail do you think we're going to get from this show? I think it's been a good one so far. Yeah, it's been like pretty... Them. I don't know. I, first of all, all the hate mail we got about the industry falling apart. I mean, 
And then Lewis got some shots fired over his bow about the Scott Byers thing, his rant at the end of the show last time. Yeah. Uh, Talk about that. Zimmerman's going to write in. Yeah, we'll get to that here in a second. Okay, Travis Shul writes in. John, I just finished listening to the Hammer Factor that you were explaining about an IR-sponsored kid event. At Montana Kayak Academy, we provide free kayak instruction to youth of the Flathead Valley. We've grown our group from six active kids to 45 active kids in two years. We teach a couple of classes every week all summer long, but I was thinking of hosting a week-long class for kids this summer. It struck me yesterday while I was listening to the podcast that maybe you would be able to help gain some attraction to the event. I had a couple of our students compete in a lower slalom at the Big Fort Whitewater Festival last year. Caleb Grady was at the event. One of my students saw him, they, and they ran, it, ran over to talk to him. They were starstruck. The idea, you might be able to help me get some professional kayakers to assist te- slash teach the class. You had mentioned in a podcast that maybe it was time that sponsored athletes begin to do outreach as part of their contact. MKA would would host the event, but IR would be the big name with pro paddlers. I recently made progress in getting access to hang slalom gates. Um, I've been tentatively uh, been granted access to the South Fork of the Flathead to set a class one two course. It would add a fun dimension to the class. As a side note, my eight year old son Amon would like to personally thank you for his skirt he uses on his slalom boat. It is dry and he can put it on himself. He has asked me numerous times if he could call you to tell you. I told him I would pass along the message. Let me know what you think. I'm excited to hear what you think, but I'm scared for you to read all of my grammatical mistakes. Ha ha. Um, Travis Shule um, writes in. I feel like Travis needs to write me a check for that plug for the Montana mm-hmm. Kayak Academy, and IR mm-hmm. needs to write me a check for the plug on the skirts. Well, do you have anything to say? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Eamon, for the Dude. for the. Uh, if you if he's, if he's really serious about this, uh, write write us at uh, um, write Max Max at immersionresearch dot com, um, and we can discuss getting athletes to show up at an event is a great idea, um, and one that I'm certainly interested in. But it's you know it's complicated. People have schedules and stuff like that. So, you you guys ever heard of Nika? The like net. the high school bikes racing league. Yeah, yeah. You know, listening when Evie was talking, my, the reason I asked is because the school that Jax goes to has a has a team that competes, and you know they've got like super young divisions, and we, he's he wants to go to one of these comps and be on the team and whatnot. But I was thinking, just judging from her excitement and what you can do on flat water, it seems to me like some kind of like NEPA national interscholastic paddling association or something like that would be a hit you guys has that ever been thrown around in your guys's history i mean there's always talk about you know the disconnect is is that if you're a kayaker you're like we if we just introduce more people to kayaking more people will kayak uh but the other side of the coin is is that there's a lot of people who know what kayaking is we're looking at and they're like there's no way i'm 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 just not interested in doing that it's a different thing than biking or skiing where it just has mass appeal that kayaking doesn't have so yeah but that's the doom it's hard to say attitude it would be interesting to see i mean they started this program at uh you know the school where jacks goes where my oldest son goes and I think the first year they had six kids and I think they've got like 85 on the team this year. Right. I mean, so from my standpoint, right, I, this is something we talk about all the time in the industry, right? And I'm a manufacturer, so I'm going to answer from a manufacturer standpoint. No, like that's what I know, but because that is um, you, uh, I, where I think the answer is going to lie anyway, is that if we had a healthier industry, right, we could we would have manufacturers that were that could afford a demo fleet. Right. Or, or a school boat or, you know, school fleet of boats. Right. Um, so if you were interested in doing a kayak program in, in your school or whatever, manufacturers would be really receptive to that because they're make you know, it's a healthy industry. We don't have that right now. Um, so in my opinion, in my opinion, you know, if we fix that, um, 
we get to a point where you know you have demo fleets in stores, you have stores teaching roll classes because they're actually interested in selling boats again. Right, right. Dagger kayaks making a ton of money. You know, they have a thousand <laughs> boats floating around the country at any given time, and you know, as part of a school program, right? These are all healthy sport type things that we do. Uh, I'm sure there's other ways to fix this, but that's how I see it. You have to admit that this would be a perfect outlet for the pro deal pricing and something like that. You know, if you're going to give pro yeah. deals, something like that. Anyway, just a thought. Yeah. And we're going to have to get into this whole getting kids into whitewater because we have several emails about it. Right. Um, Stephen Formosa writes in again. Um, Dobby says season's greetings via this gift to you, John Grace, for inviting 50 billion people to the Green Race. P.S. The race was rad, and he sends a picture of his little dog with a proper little bag of poop. <laughs> that was a tiny poop. <laughs> That's a tiny dog. That is like, <laughs> dude, that poop is smaller than his thumbnail. Yeah. Can we can we talk about the El Cap of uh, a kayaking? Yeah, we've how, how we've we touched on this? this a few times. We have, um, we have. What's the answer? Well, I think you have an answer. Um, let me read Max's email here. Um, this comes in from just Max. He says, first off, I almost got the shakes from the break in the Hammer Factor content between nine six and eleven twenty two. Um, a question, what is the kayaking equivalent of Alex Hinald's free solo climb of El Cap? Is it Sydney the largest, most marginal rapid, i.e. Dane and Malupa? Or is it time? Or is it the uh, record time solo wilderness class 5 run, uh, Annie Ole on the Stikine at high water? As always, thanks for the show and your wisdom, Max. I believe you have an answer, John? Well, I think if you're talking a solo run, I think what you guys did on... Uh, Middle Kings and the Stikine would certainly be in the running, right? A single day descent of those rivers, which, I mean, especially the Middle Kings. I mean, I, but done like, that. I mean, that's not really exactly the same as a free solo ascent, right? I mean, like, there's a lot of, like, really badass speed climbing records that are probably more relevant to that conversation. I mean, I'm not to undercut the badassness of Middle Kings in the day, which is as a, I, mean, I recall having this conversation. You guys first did that with a buddy of mine who had just gotten up in Middle Kings and he compared it to the moon landing, which <laughs> seems like reasonable. <laughs> like, it's badass. But, like, I'm not sure that's the right comparison. It's hard to compare I don't know. them. Maybe, I, I don't think there is one. I don't think there well, is Well, there one. isn't because, you you know, the, the only comparison is is that you ha- you're committed to going fast and light once you put on that river with no gear in your boat, right? Or you're going to have a miserable couple nights out of the river and you're going to, you know be very hungry yeah there's there's you can't bring any stuff because it'll slow you down you won't make it i think the everest of kayaking is the sangpo gorge i think that's pretty clear and you know there's a lot in there that hasn't been done oh don't i know it you know there's a lot i was i was i was slated for that first expedition nobody's nobody's you know, you, you're not paying any guides to take you down the same po either. You know, I think it would be way more badass than the Everest guy. Yeah, right. No, I mean Everest is, as a metaphor, not as an actual thing. Yep. <laughs> yep. Mike Getlin writes in. He says, uh, "I, I don't know the answer to that. It's such a, I don't know. I'm just so scared of heights when I watch that movie." My hands sweat when you're probably yeah. watching. Yeah. It's 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 so scary. Uh, Mike Getlin writes in uh, subject line results of unique Waka plastic durability test. I guess there's some talk about the durability of Waka plastic out there and it being subpar. So he decided to drop his steez off of the interstate it got run over by an f-250 and it turned up fine so he says though i'm a little ashamed that my beater and apparently does not stop at the takeout i think this should at the very least give evan some good ammo there's a mind. lot of anecdotal evidence about weak plastic among boats and depends on who you ask it's any of the boat manufacturers make the weakest boats at any given time so i uh, i don't buy into any of that it's, it's just pretty on than everybody else Right. Well, yeah, a roto molded kayak is or <laughs> different than a blow molded kayak. There's no question about that. No, no, we're not different. <laughs> and then it's all about just the cooking. You just got to cook it right. 
Yeah, um, I suppose you could screw up that way. Uh, Wes Johnson. This is addressed to Grayson Weld. Being Lewis doesn't have any kids that we know of. Uh, what tools have you used to get your kids on the water, and what have they enjoyed most? What have been some big wins with your kids on the water? What have been some bad experience with your kids in the water that you have learned from or would do differently? What kinds of boats, duos, canoes, paddle boards have you experimented with and your, have your kids enjoyed the most? I live in the southeast and have two kids, a two-year-old and a seven-month-old, and they are both playing in the water a bunch. We go to an indoor pool year-round, and they are getting a lot of time in the water. I spent a lot of time last summer with my daughter in my lap in my green boat on flat water and on the lower green, and that has been great because we can catch Eddie's surf and go fast. I want to get something different that we can stretch out a little in and have options for multi-day trips later on. I'm thinking a canoe is ideal so I can store gear and take both kids once everyone is swimming independently, but I wanted to hear your recommendations. Uh, well, do you have any recommendations there? Well, I'm part of the I'm part of the greatest generation of kayakers, right? The baby boomers <laughs> of kayakers, so to speak. Which means that I learned in the seventies in a canoe with my parents or my dad specifically. I talked about my dad about this the other day at length. He listens to the show and he calls it and comments on it. But he uh, you know, he would be like, We're going canoeing this weekend and that's what we're doing. And in fact, everyone I paddled with, that's how we all basically got started. Grace, you probably were the same boat, right? Mm-hmm. You're going, and you get at some point you get sick of being in the canoe, and you have no choice. You're going out paddling that weekend, right? That's just what's going to happen with the family. And at some point, you're like, I just would rather not be in this canoe if I have to do this. <laughs> and you get a kayak, right? So that's A. B. That was fine, and I got to be a proficient kayaker whether I liked it or not, just because I had to go, right? I, I don't know if parents are really geared that way anymore, but that's the way we did it back then. Then the, the where it really started to come together was a peer group. When I went to Valley Mill, old group. And uh, and uh, paddled with a bunch of a bunch of bratty teenagers my age and you know 13, 14, 15, 16, and that's where it just took off. Um, having kids of my own, I kind of on the same program. Like we're just going to go kayaking, and that's what they're going to do. And there's a lot of crying and screaming and pouting and posturing. There used to be, but they eased into it and they realized at some point they had no choice and they they got on board. <laughs> And they ended up kind of liking it. The only thing I would caution is, you know, sometimes you're like, man, I really want, he's really ready to run cucumber or whatever rapid you're going to talk, like class two, three rapid. And it could backfire if you push too hard. You know, you want him to, I think the better place for him to really be challenging himself is with his peer group where it, it comes, it goes a whole different dynamic than, you know, dad takes you out and forces you through cucumber, you float over a terrible swim and you hate kayaking forever so <laughs> i agree with that one the peer group is so uh such a big deal even in evie's interview she mentioned you know just that group that core group of friends but yeah. one craft i will say that i take my kids on that has been incredible that i believe is much better than the canoe is the liquid logic versa board if you if you don't know what that is wes check one of those out it's great because the kid can jump on and off of the board anytime yeah. throughout the day. They're not stuck in the canoe, like right. you say. It, yeah, it's, it's just the canoe. It's just be, you're going out to the river. That's what we're doing. We're all going, right? Yeah. Um, versa board, canoe, whatever. Yeah, I, I think that's good. The, ver- the versa board's super rad because they're not stuck in it and they can yeah. jump on and off. And I've just went with groups of families that are in canoes, and my kids are having five times more fun. Um, we need to do a whole show on kids in the water though, because I mean, obviously the sport needs some fresh blood. Um, we've got Fred Morrison going on about some, (laughs) who wrote that title? (laughs) That must've been you. Well, Fred writes in solution to kayaking financial crisis. Gentlemen, um, don't read this one me out. He, this, this cock maybe plan does not need it. I, I'm going to surmise it for you. Fred <laughs> suggests we make a Top Gun movie about kayaking. And that's going to change everything. <laughs> right, we just move on. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. It was a good email. It made me laugh. <laughs> I'll put that one in the show notes. It's worth he was like, he was like, look what, look what Top Gun did to the, to the Navy or whatever. <laughs> or Aspen. You know, when you stream. like, <laughs> when people talk about surfing, like. Like, like Gidget, like the 60s stuff. That's still like 
thing, but I don't think we need to be blown away. Let's <laughs> blown away the, the problem, the problem with kayak. I know we get back to this, but people. The thing no about more doom is, and gloom. We're positive. We've passed that part of the show. We're 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 moving forward. There is no problem with kayaking. It's great. All I'll, right. Now go ahead, Dallas. People don't look at like people look at surfing they're like yeah I want to try that they look at biking they're like oh that's something I can do they look at like the Red Bull even the Red Bull Rampage it's some aspect of something they're familiar with which is biking people look at kayaking and it's the same thing as some guy in a barrel going over Niagara or one of those morons in a bat suit jumping off a cliff in Switzerland it's just cockamamie nutso stuff it doesn't make doesn't add up to it's just a stunt right it's a Red Bull thing. And and so it's just a, that's just where these mainstream efforts to get people kayaking fall apart, right? Dude, I don't know if that's true, man. That's why you need to come to the green race. Yeah, you, you need to see how many people come hike in, watch that thing, and then they're like the Jeremy Nashes of the world. Clearly, the turn in this industry the past year has started to get to me, right? Clearly, <laughs> yeah. I need to I need a hiatus. <laughs> you just need to I'm go. Sorry. You just need to go truck and trailer with Lewis for a little while. Is that it? <laughs> I, think I can tell the industry's taking a downturn if the our holiday party is moving from uh, from Freem to Chips. No, we're going to Freem after. We're going to Freem afterwards. We're starting at Chips. <laughs> the beers are like two dollars less each. Oh <laughs> man, uh, let's let's read Bryce. Bryce lays into Lewis here a little bit. Hey guys, always enjoy the podcast and the banner. Keep it up. Geltman had the opportunity to press buyers on the issue, but he did not until Scott got off the phone. The interview was cordial and some questions were asked, and then the interview ended. As soon as Scott disconnected, Geltman let loose on questions he never asked and other accusations. Very unprofessional. I didn't think much about it, eh, but then it continued in his rant this past episode. Scott came on and gave uh, exclamation mark. Scott came on and gave his best PR response, and that's his job. If you wanted more... You should have been better prepared for the interview. Geltman made it out like it was Scott's responsibility to bring up the tough issues and then called him out when he didn't have the opportunity to respond. I'd love if you all start having people on and discuss substantive issues, but, you're, but you've got to do it professionally if you want to be taken seriously, which you may not care about, which is cool. It's your podcast, and I'll probably keep listening. Um, what would you say to Bryce, Mr. Geltman? I mean, he's right. Like, I mean, I should have brought these things up at the, you know, at the time. You know, I am certainly not a professional podcast reviewer, and I I will recommit myself in the future to when we have guests on who are saying things that trouble me to be more direct in my uh, questioning of those people. Um, you know, I, I feel like I've given Scott a pretty good time, and I, I'm, you know, regrettable of some of that but not the entirety of it and uh, i mean he makes some good points I'm, i feel like i've kind of said my piece on this subject all right uh here's from clay wright clay says good episode guys referencing the last show um haven't listened in, in ages as i remembered it being a bit ego driven <laughs> clay clay for those who don't know is a an old school poter uh, who works at Jackson? Like, I mean, he's more than just an old school guy. He's, he's a very veteran. Yeah, he's yeah. he's he's the real deal. But he were also is coming from Jackson Cox, so who's you know, it's not a complete partial impartial voice. <laughs> What's he say? The sense of the kayak industry awareness well is putting out is very real. Unpleasant, but needs to be shared. Everyone is in trouble. Wreck collapsed. Sup collapsed. Is fishing next? Question mark. Buyers need to recognize this is the best of times in terms of boat choices, sizes, and cost. We're about to have fewer choices for more dollars. I appreciate, um, I, I think that's Lewis's disappointment at being, tie, being lied to people he didn't expect it from. Corporate money can make good people into spokesperson. They might not even know how gaslighted they are. And it came across that way to me. Not anger, just disappointment, and that seems justified and worth mentioning. AT was a top-end, benchmark, powerful force in the industry, even if Confluence paddlers weren't there for the heyday. Great job on the reel. Love to see some Stoke generating stuff next time. 68, very impressive, uh, referencing how many shows we've had. Thanks for the fun green race, too. Hmm. Thanks for that, Clay. Some good Ego-driven. 
Well, well. <laughs> That's a new one. That's a new one. Um, here is one on public lands. This is another one addressed to you, addressed to you, Lewis. I uh, love the show. Great way to get my stoke on when I can't get my paddle strokes in. Lewis Piton big time on public lands. He mistakenly commented on the green parking being on public land and ignored that those two hundred nine dollar a day Vail tickets are on public land. What business are you in again, Lewis? Question mark. Let's go back to community on ski lifts. Two remain uh, in Washington, Leavenworth and Loop Loop, and one in Alaska, Cordova, I believe. Or maybe that's too much like paddling clubs. Oh wait, we got thriving paddling clubs in Washington too. Bottom line, explaining in how it's okay in your world to charge to ski on public land, but not to park. Lewis, why is it okay to charge to ski on public land, but not to park? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Any <laughs> uh, held here just... <laughs> just put, pinned you to the ground, my friend. <laughs> What's the wrestling move they just did? A grapevine? Help me out, guys. Uh, double chicken wing for sure. Oh, man. Because that's Grape, too... that's a thing. A grapevine? Is, oh, that, yeah. is that a thing? That's yeah. a single leg and a double leg grapevine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Which one did Geltman just get, you reckon? Ah, oh, that's <laughs> definitely. Dude, that's a full <laughs> Nelson right there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. So let's go back to uh, Lucas Reitman. Here's a let's turn the corner a little bit. Lewis loved your advice on how to get a kayaking brand sponsorship. Just get a fucking job. <laughs> if someone is under the illusion that you can make financial gains from kayaking, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Just go mow Amen. a lawn, buy <laughs> buy that helmet, and go paddle with your friends. A parental sponsorship seems to be all the rage with kids these days. Anyway. Keep it up, it's, Lucas. This is a timeless classic. And I don't get this Weld's buddy. This was sent to you. This was, Lewis, you sent this in. Who was Weld's buddy here? The domestic terrorist? <laughs> he's, <laughs> Sorry, my internet he's, cut out for a second there. Who's Weld's buddy, Matt Shea, the domestic terrorist? Give us the summation on this. I didn't understand. Geltman last episode was poking this bee's nest with a stick, calling out the guy who's who's who basically has a laser sight on his on the back of his head right now while he's podcasting. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to bring everybody up to speed, we had this long conversation about the three percenters and the militia members spurred by by Weld's sharing that article about this guy Matt Shea who's this Eastern Washington legislator who's batshit crazy. He's a patriot. And, and the uh the 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 Washington State legislature just did a like an investigation into him and that was concluded that he was a domestic terrorist and therefore to get to the FBI. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's like my buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Look out for Virginia Rifleman sixty nine or whoever that was. It might be coming for you next. <laughs> were you were you were saying that the other day, uh, last show? Grace and I were just sitting there, just stone faced, looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> Whew. Um. All right. So we had uh, Todd Baker wrote in about the Yacht Dam conspiracy and how the level is just one tenth of a foot below the runnable level or above it or however that works john you found the answer i found the answer uh so to recap the how pow falls can be run when it's under a certain level right um and there's a dam of stream of how pow falls uh that regulates the water pretty much entirely during the summer and it always seems like the the river is like one tenth of an inch too high to run the falls uh, and it was to a point where many people thought, including Todd, that there was some kind of conspiracy with the dam and the falls level. So I talked to Eric Martin, who is sort of the godfather of Ohio pile rafting. And he says it's completely false. There is no truth to that whatsoever. He said the dam does not in any way, shape or form regulate water uh, for the falls. They're basically worried about um, barges going downstream and then the rafting companies bargain for releases on the weekend uh, to go up to two feet so they get a little more water for weekend releases but 
um, there is virtually no communication between the state park and the dam in terms of water levels. The state park has no vested interest in that. And in terms of the falls being a runnable thing, the people who control the water at the dam doesn't even know that exists. It doesn't even in their lexicon. So there's no way that the dam would ever know or care or know any, have anything to do with the falls being runnable or unrunnable. They don't even know what that means, basically. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Mm-hmm. And Epstein killed himself. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I think I think you're asking the questions right now that need to be answered, John Gray. <laughs> oh God, we're off the rails. We've got a few more things, but we're going to save them for the next show. Um, I really want to get into. Can I talk about the pack rafting? Oh, we talked about the pack rafting already a little bit. Yeah, like yesterday when we started this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get a pack raft and I'm going to try it out. I'm going to borrow Kevin Colburn's. He lives right down the road from me. I'll give you guys a report because I'm super interested in that. These guys, they were having a blast. I mean, they were having fun. So you can't argue with that. Okay, everyone. Now to your favorite section of the show. This is our rants and rave section where our hosts go on a little bit of a rant or a little bit of a rave about something they're all warm and fuzzy about or something that's poking them in the side. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Lewis, tell me you have something. I got something. Yeah. Ready? You guys ready to ready to make some new enemies? Are we done with confluence now. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. So, when I was down in Chile, one of my buddies had the misfortune of renting a kayak from Pucon Kayak Hostel, and they have a kayak rental policy that is a is a scam. Like, they are ripping off kayakers by doing this. And the policy is that if you break the boat, or the boat breaks while you're paddling it, I should say, you're meant to buy them a brand new kayak. So my buddy rented a two-year-old 9R, which does what did what two-year-old 9Rs do, which is got a small crack in the chine. Dude goes to return the boat, and the guys that are like, you owe us $1,100 for having the misfortune of being the person who happened to be in this boat when it decided to give up the ghost. And I was like, dude, like when you go back there, like you got to tell this guy to go fuck themselves. Like do not fucking pay $1,100 for breaking a two year old boat. And like, they worked out some scenario where like his buddy gave Puko and Kaya Costal, uh, like a, you know, like a two week old boat. But I mean, this is insane. Like, this is a scam. Like, that is not a rental policy, right? It's like if you go to the car rental place and rent a truck and you wrap the truck around a tree, like, yeah, you owe the kayak rental place. Like, if you drive it off the lot and the engine seizes, like, they owe you, you know? It's like, my buddy Tom, he should have gone back to Kukon Kayak Hostel and been like, I want half my money back. I had to paddle a broken boat for half the trip. Like, like, you know what I mean? It's like, serial boats just break, like. It's like if you're renting boats out, you know, it's fine to be like, okay, if you swim or you pin the kayak or you drop it off the truck and it gets run over by another truck, like, yeah, you, you owe the place you rent the boat from. But if you just happen to be the person paddling it when the boat got a crack in it, like as old kayaks do, like the idea that you owe them anything is bullshit, let alone the price of a new kayak when what you started with was a two-year-old kayak to begin with. Like that is a scam. Like if you're going down to Chile, like stay the fuck away from Pucon Kayak Hostel. That was my rant. How did it end up? Did he buy the boat? They have he, his card? They gave him... He gave Pukun Kai Costal his other buddies, like, two-week-old 9R that he had to buy from his friend. So, like, basically had to swap out, like, a brand-new boat. And then Pukun Kai Costal bought the broken boat back from him from some diminished sum of money. It's a free market, like, buddy. I mean, dude, whatever, man. Like, that is <laughs> that is a scam. Like, I would not. I mean, just, like, stay the fuck away from that, man. Like, that is, like, that's just, like, not even a policy. Like, that's ripping people off. Am I wrong? Is there any leg to stand on here? Does anybody want to argue with me? Because I've thought this through and I'm ready to, I'm heated about it. <laughs> well, I mean, a new boat seems a little excessive unless that's what it costs them a thousand bucks to get a boat even if it's a used one down there i mean dude whatever man it's like boats break it's like that's you I mean how many how much money have you made renting that boat out for two years already yeah it's like 
Seems a little excessive. What was the cost of renting the boat? I don't know. Maybe like 200 bucks a week. Hmm. I don't know. Just, yeah, stay aware. Seems <laughs> a little shoddy. Well, do you have anything for us? Well, I, I'm going to turn this into a positive. I'm going to ra- I'm going to rave about about uh, East Coast white water, <laughs> <laughs> dude. <laughs> dude, the water just turned on today, man. I know. <laughs> All right, <laughs> maybe next episode I'll have a different story. <laughs> it's been such a crisis for me. This whole summer has been been a tough one. I had to rethink my my uh, yeah my policy on how I'm going to keep keep paddling. I, I'm not sure. That's a tough one. You you can't argue about the access and the number of days that the waters that the rivers run, especially over the past couple of years. It's been ridiculous, right? I mean, with all the rain. But it'll come around. It always does. Yeah. No, I know. That's right. Well, I got it's a lot of fun. No question about it. I got a rave. Um, I'm gonna rave about. Paddling, kayaking, whitewater, rivers, and friendships. Because I just got off a Grand Canyon trip with people I don't get to see that that much, who I've been friends with for some of them for over 30 years. And you just get a common mission of getting in your boat and going down a river and kayaking and the friendships you make. It's just, they just mesh up, you know, it's like friends and kayaking i'm just gonna rave around about that because i just had a 10 days of that and uh it rejuvenated my soul so that's what i'm gonna rave about yeah boy all right anything else you guys would like to add before we shut this two and a half hour marathon down Mm. (sighs) straight to chips straight to chips give uh blackburn my best hard fighter man god dang hard fighter can happen to anyone um check out the whitewater journal oh, right on boys check out the t-shirt and uh merry christmas guys you yeah. merry christmas <laughs> <laughs>